liberty and justice for all. Right. Thank you all for coming for this meeting. Um, the announcements, this is the special meeting of the Board of Supervisors. There will be another special meeting at 9 o'clock on Monday right here. Uh, the next regular meeting is scheduled for Friday, January 8th at 9 a.m. here at the Community Center. And if you haven't done so yet, please silence or turn off your cell phones. And this special meeting will be for presentations from management companies. And our first management company is Brown Golf. So I will turn the meeting over to you. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. District Supervisors, thank you. My name is PJ Politan. My title is uh, Director of Management Services. I live in Atlantic Beach, Florida. It's about four hours north. Um, and this is Bryce Voison. Bryce, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yep, my name is Bryce Voison. I'm Director of Revenue for Brown Golf Management. I work in our Orlando office. It's in Kissimmee uh, at Orange Lake Resort. Thanks for having us today. We really appreciate everybody's time. We look forward to giving the presentation. A couple things about the presentation. Our owner was intending to be here. He was not feeling well. So he decided to stay home at, at this point. So um, he did record a video that will show, that will kind of kick off our presentation. And at 1.30, we'll have a, uh, a call in, a Zoom meeting with our venture capital partner. Uh, his name is Eric Quisenberry. He is our point person for all most of our business ventures on an ownership standpoint. So he's going to just speak to uh, the relationship and the partnership. Uh, that's that's going to be right at 1.30, so it, um, we invite you at that point while he's on the Zoom conference to uh, ask any questions you may have. Uh, again, his name is Eric Quisenberry. So um, with that said, we're going to start with John Brown, who is the president, CEO of Brown Golf. This is about a five-minute video here, just an introduction about Brown Golf and the company. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Brown. I'm the president of Brown Management. I had every intention of being at this meeting in person. Unfortunately, as of Wednesday, I started to develop some symptoms that could be related to COVID. So, to err on the same side, I opted uh, not to travel down uh, to Florida. I'm actually in Pennsylvania. We were not in quarantine in my bedroom right now. So, uh, but I did want to make at least an introduction. This is where we could be in a career person. I think one of the elements of our company, which is unique, is that uh, the owner is the president and the CEO of the company will be on site. Uh, they do get to know the employees, they do get to know the board, um, and it's unfortunate that we couldn't be forward. However, we are great aims with PJ and Grace, uh, two of the best operators in our company, and so I know we'll be able to take this after the what we can bring to the table. With that said, I did want to introduce you to who Brown Golf Management is. PJ has uh, six slides, I believe, to talk about our company. I'll keep this very short and sweet because I know a lot of information to get to. But we're a company that uh, became incorporated in January of 2011. The company originated with four members uh, my father, John Brown, and myself, John Brown. Uh, both of our backgrounds were in true golf. My dad was an executive at True, and I worked for True for seven years. Uh, my brother Todd was part of our company initially, and then uh, Jason Marshall for uh, As we sit today, there are three others. It's myself, uh, my partner, my CFO, Jason Marshall, and there's one additional owner that was working on business, Dave Moreno. We bought, I bought my father out in July of 2017, so I've been the president since July of 2017. We have grown the company since inception in 2011 to 19 locations and 26 small prisons. We're located in seven states. We're very much wired uh, to understand the bottom line of golf. So that really uh, has a foundation in our inception. We partnered with a venture capital partner, and our relationship was a new real market. We find golf courses that were for sale, and we purchased those golf courses based on how we were able to find those golf courses that set the long term lease rates for our company. Our venture capital partner will be on the land, and we would have long term business lease rates for our company. That's how our company originated, and that is why each of the 
decision that we made today is rooted in this great decision for the final line. Do we understand? Do we understand how we want to try to get this experience? With our bank account and third party management control, we did venture it into third party management as well. And as we sit today, of our 19 locations, nine of our long term leases, 10 of our third party management deals, we do have two very strong municipality deals, which we're very proud of and have really enjoyed our venture into working with municipalities. And hopefully, we will have the opportunity to reach out to some of our references and have a perspective on what they believe the relationship has been since they've hired Brown and Walton and just the importance of the public facilities themselves. We are very excited to be talking to some of the late Island Club, the annual revenues, the percentage of revenues that are involved with it is food and beverage. Every component of that is very much against the model that we've had success in, which really gives us a high level of excitement to be talking with the present team today. Of the 19 locations we have, 17 are the daily fee component, 75 the daily fee component. So very much against the model in some way. I can tell you that one thing that is important to Brown is partnering with the right folks, the folks that believe the business decisions in the health facility are very important, that they will perpetuate a long-term successful game plan, that we can make business-rooted decisions and not only necessarily emotional-rooted decisions when it comes to operating our facilities. We want to create great value, great experience. We want to provide expertise to decision-makers like yourself. But at the end of the day, we want to produce a long-term, self-sustaining asset that can bring us. That's what's important to us. We believe we've done that through our current partners. We would like to expand for them and sell that market as a great growth company. Our 54 Gold Resort, you know, with the stream now, the hour and a half in Orange Lake is one of the largest success stories we have. And hopefully, as you get a chance to go through this presentation, you'll have an understanding of what we're rooted in, how we think, what we believe in, and hopefully one day you'll be us to be very good. And if that day does come, I look forward to meeting everybody in person at that point. Very disappointed I couldn't be there today, but very excited about the opportunity to present. We look forward to presenting and hopefully hearing some great questions and feedback and we're here as a resource. Thank you. All right, John touched on the first six slides, so we'll just go through them here. In his opening video here, just touches on established in 2011. We have 19 facilities, 26 golf courses in seven states. You can go ahead. Here is the state-by-state breakdown, mostly on the East Coast, one in Missouri, Branson, Missouri. The ownership group, John, Jason, and Lee. Jason's the CFO and a CPA. And then Lee Arroyo is one of the partners. This is our corporate team. Joe Radigan, myself, Justin Saliga, Brent Miller, Bryce, JP, Sarah, Sean, and Teresa. That really makes up most of the individuals on this slide are based in our corporate office in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. So it's a small corporate footprint. As you can see, Bryce and Brent are located up the street in Orlando. And again, I'm based out of Atlantic Beach, Florida. Here's the organizational chart. It's a little difficult to see, but just basically breaks down the previous slide and the corporate team. And then here are our two locations for our corporate offices. John did mention some of our services. So we have acquisition and leases. We have third-party management. We have accounting management. And we have created another business, Golf Back, that we'll touch on in detail as we go through the presentation. All right, so this is kind of the start of the meat and potatoes of the presentation here. And 
I wanted to highlight the scope of our management. So um, like the other three companies that are presenting, uh, we, uh, as far as the scope of management, offer all of the services which are detailed here. We have taken a different approach to our presentation. I think what's going to be a different approach, we've made a lot of comparisons to uh, some of the success stories that we've had, especially at another location not too far from here uh, in Summerfield, Florida, just outside of Ocala, Eagle Ridge. It's a Del Webb retirement community. But I did want to just, just make sure that everybody knew that the scope of services incorporate all, all, all of the uh, what, is, what is required by the RFP and what the facility needs. So um, I'm, we're not going to go over this in too much detail. I did throughout the RFP process and the literature I sent that was kind of outlined in that RFP. But Omar, if you want to continue on. So this is the comparison. We wanted to, to highlight Eagle Ridge Golf Club. Again, it's in Summerfield, Florida. 36-hole facility, 340 acres. The community has 3,251 homes. They have 234 full members and 104 seasonal members. As we go through the membership offerings, the clubs share a lot of uh, similarities as far as their offerings for both daily fee and for, for membership. We do uh, alternate four nines at that facility, and uh, we double tee just about every day. So um, they, they do uh, a lot of rounds, 125, 130,000 rounds on the, on the uh, 36 holes. The Browns break down, as you can see, 70% uh, community and 30% outside play. It's very community focused. That's a, a, an important piece at Eagle Ridge. Um, and then they also have a la carte and banquet facilities there. They have a practice, a practice area and driving range as well. So here's a slide on the membership. You can kind of see uh, most of these slides here. You'll be able to see the uh, we're going to break down uh, financial financials from Sun and Lake and compare it to Eagle Ridge on the right-hand side here. So from 2017 to 2020, as you can see, they're pretty pretty similar. Um, and, and all of these numbers on here on the right in the that's uh, formatted in Excel. It's a uh, it's a year to date August 2020. I, I believe you run on a fiscal year ending September 30th, so it's an 11 month period. I've taken an apples to apples comparison, and that's year to date through November 2020. So we just did those financials, and, and that's what's showing here. And that's throughout every one of the slides. So uh, this main, the main part of, of this member, uh, the membership piece here is, is just evaluating the membership pricing and, and making sure that the membership pricing is not cannibalizing premium tea times. We're very conscious of tea times. We want to make it available to the community, but there is a balance in, in availability at tee times and making sure that the club is profitable. Um, as you can see, membership growth has, uh, has increased over the course of the last four years, but with that said, the green car fees have declined, and we'll touch on that in a later slide. <clears throat> This is the membership pricing. As you can see, it's uh, very similar as far as full golf, single golf. Uh, the price points are um, are very similar there. I know that we all, uh, Sun and Lake does offer, I believe, three, four, five, six, and seven month memberships. Um, I, I pulled them out and I showed, I, I'm sorry, it's a three and five month membership, but I did apples to apples comparison. I wanted to show the price points. We do have a lot of people who travel from the Northeast and Canada uh, that, that visit and, and have the seasonal memberships at uh, Eagle Ridge. So I wanted to show that comparison with the price points, very comparable there. And as you can see, the, the offerings are very similar as well. Rounds of golf. This is where um, the thought process at Eagle Ridge and all of our facilities is based on operating for profit and, and then reinvesting back into the club. So that's our mentality. We approach every day like that. And we uh, try to maximize the number of rounds and the average dollar per round. We wanted to show the comparisons between the two clubs. As you can see, um, as far as the rounds go, with the exception of this year, uh, Sun and Lake has uh, declined for the most part, 2018 and 2000, or, uh, 2019, 2020, a slight increase. 
Um, this is just a, a comparison with the number of rounds done. We try every day to maximize the tee sheet at Eagle Ridge, and that is why in the future slides here, you'll see the profitability uh, between the two clubs. On the right here, you can see the average dollar per round. That has uh, come down substantially over the last four years. So green and cards fees, this is, uh, again, a, a big a big revenue stream that we try to focus on on a daily basis. You can see total for the last four years, uh, Sun and Lake has done $5.3 million compared to Eagle Ridge, $6.5 million, $6.6 million. Uh, you can see the decline year over year. Um, and uh, we, we, we know uh, facilitating member tee times is, is crucial to the club's success. However, um, daily fee, maximizing daily fee times is, is important for profitability as well. So there's, there's just a difference there in the 36 holes over the course of the last four years. Food and beverage. The food and beverage to, uh, here at Sun and Lake does do more in revenues on an, on an annual basis, about 2. 2, uh, I'm sorry, 1.2 to 1.3 million dollars over the course of the last four years. This year being the exception, as we all know, there's been a lot of limitations on that front. But this kind of gives you an idea. We like to see, for profitability, the a la carte and banquet revenue at about 50-50 split. So uh, Sun and Lake at this point operates the a la carte revenue is a little bit higher as a percentage. Um, as you get higher uh, a la carte revenue compared to banquet revenue, your cost typically will go up. So that balance of 50-50 is a great split between the two. In addition to that, on a profitability side in food and beverage, and we manage all of our food and beverage uh, facilities and uh, all the clubs with food and beverage as a profit center. So it is an amenity, but it's important that um, it's making money or breaking even. Uh, taking a loss in food and beverage, I think uh, we just don't believe in that. We believe there's opportunities there. So uh, the other bullet point here is the alcohol sales. As you can see, the alcohol sales well, uh, from the club's financials, the alcohol sales make up about 30% of total food and beverage sales. We would, we would recommend, and, and what we do at other clubs is, is increasing that as well. So creating um, events and strategies to increase that percentage up to hopefully 50-50 split. That 50-50, if you can get to there, the, the food and beverage really uh, starts to become profitable. So limited waste. Um, and better margins on alcohol sales. So continue on with food and beverage. This is some of the expense side at Sun and Lake compared to Eagle Ridge. This was uh, one of the more important slides that we feel as far as operators go, and you can see the comparisons here, and this is really what will dictate profitability is just expense control. So one, two to one, three million in total revenues, uh, we believe you should be able to break even or make money at that revenue. The expense side, this is all controllable. And with a strategy every day of managing the labor, managing the cost of goods, and managing other ancillary food and beverage expenses, it's, it's crucial on an everyday basis. So you can see the comparisons here between both clubs. Uh, the top right is cost of goods sold, which is, uh, excuse me, over the last four years has been pretty much in line. This year it's a little high. We did notice as we reviewed the club's financials that the alcohol as a percentage uh, is 49%. So it could be a number of factors. could be um, overpouring, could be um, not, not having uh, alcohol priced properly, but there there is a number of, uh, it could be pilferage as well, but that, that alcohol uh, cost of goods sold at 49% is really, uh, is, is really high compared to an industry average of between 30 and 35%. On the expense side, you can see, and so each, each percent here, as you look at this, each percent is on the cost of goods side is about $5,000. So you can see the delta there. On the expense side, 
Um, you can see it's, uh, you spend about twice as much in, uh, in expenses in food and beverage as we do there at Eagle Ridge. And then on the labor side, it's, it's really a substantial number there. So each one of, each percentage point there, it just adds up. We average uh, this year 30, 38% compared to uh, year to day, year to date August 2020. It's at 61.77%. So we see a lot of opportunity on the expense side with, uh, with strategy, with um, food and beverage strategy, which I've sent a lot of information via email that you'll get, and we can certainly review some of the things we do as far as creating menus and um, how we schedule labor. All of that um, needs to be managed on a daily basis. This is the comparison between the two clubs. A quick question on, yeah. on the comparison. The, um, obviously, our revenue is higher. Does that mean we're clearly a full-service restaurant? Is Eagle Ridge a full-service, or is it more of a grill operation? Do you have more takeout, more people just getting food to run out the golf course with? We, uh, we do have a lot more takeout this year, but uh, no, it is full service. So, and we do a lot of rounds, so, and we have a lot of member groups. So it's very similar as, as we saw the member group uh, activity, which is fairly substantial on a tea time basis. And, uh, and, and they do a lot more rounds, and the members come in and, and, and have the, uh, the, uh, the a la carte space. We also have banquet space. Uh, at Eagle Ridge as well. So it is open 365, 360 days a year, and they do provide an a la carte service to the membership. Uh, just about the same type of hours of operations, 11 to 8, a little bit earlier on Sundays, close a little earlier on Sundays, but uh, very similar as far as operations go. Um, these costs as percentages should just kind of stay in line. The more revenue you do, you should you should continue to, to be at these percentages. Or, Eagle Ridge is managed very, very well. Some clubs are even better than this in our portfolio. Some clubs uh, not quite there, but um, most of the clubs, again, we operate food and beverage for profit, um, are, uh, are better than the way the, the club is operating currently. So this is the next slide is going to be a... This is this is the net profit. So as I was saying, um, this year it looks like from what uh, I pulled from the from the RFP, the club is going to operate at an operating loss of about 121,000. And we understand that uh, it's an important piece. The renovations. I didn't see what the the club looked like before, but the, we add lunch in the restaurant. It's a very nice space. So uh, and you have the additional banquet space there. So again, when you add up all those expenses, and the total profitability of food and beverage between the two clubs over the last four years, you can see 114,000 for Sutton Lake compared to 425,000. So we don't do as much revenue, but there, our margins are better. And that's, that's primarily on the cost side. Uh, this is a total labor side, so this uh, that kind of concludes the food and beverage at this point. Certainly ask, answer any questions about operations. And again, you'll receive an email um, about a number of things of how we operate. We also have a food and beverage intranet site. It's available to any food and beverage staff, and we've populated uh, best practices, operating procedures, all in this intranet site that everybody has access to, all the staff members. I'd be glad to show you that as well. This is a total labor slide. We have a few more minutes. I just want to let everybody know we have a few more minutes, and then I'm going to bring Eric Quisenberry, so I'll probably uh, go through another couple slides, and then we'll, we'll bring him up. So, but this is a total labor slide. Uh, this, um, the total labor is, is, this is a key factor for profitability, probably the most important in managing this. Brown Golf throughout our portfolio operates at 40% of revenues. The club, as you can see, Sun and Lakes operated between 47 and 50% at uh, 1.2, $1.3 million in total labor. Each percentage point equals $12,500. So if you can, if the idea is to manage more efficiently, provide still exceptional service, but do so with strategies 
that will bring down that total labor cost throughout um, throughout every department and, and seeking those efficiencies. We look at this total labor number because we're operating and we own the cash flow at nine of the facilities. We manage our managed clubs like we own the cash flow. So this is an important number for us. So um, <clears throat> this is the total revenue as you can see. Since 2017, uh, the clubs declined. Uh, year to date through August, it looks like the EBITDA number is about $29,000 short of the budget. Uh, as you can see, the total revenues between the two clubs are almost identical there, as you can see, 13.9 to 13.7. We'll do one more slide, and then we'll bring Eric up. So this is... Uh, these are these are a few items from the from 2017 to 2020 that kind of stood out for us. Um, just some general expenses. We really, because we again because we own the cash flow of a lot of our facilities, we look at every single line item expenses if we owned it. And I just wanted to share. I did share some of these in the RFP, um, but payroll processing. We noticed that the. The expense was $28,100 against the market of 3000 so we saw that as an opportunity. Some IT, hardware, software, computer supplies, 14700 compared to a market of about 5000 And these numbers are pulled from, again, Eagle Ridge and like facilities. Education is another 4000 Training and development of staff amongst all the clubs. This is a little over 18,000. Uh, the websites, and we'll touch on this, that we build ourselves through our technology platform, that could be eliminated. It's built in-house. It's another 1,600. Graphic de design, same thing. Uh, we could eliminate that because it's done in-house. It's all part of our management. Um, that's 4,300 there. Sales management, I wasn't exactly sure. We'll touch on some sales and marketing, but I wasn't exactly sure what that expense was. And that's close to 4,000 there. And then a mystery shopper evaluations of another 1,300 there. The total, it's about $80,000 that um, it's just, I just wanted to share as we went through the RFP and the financials could be some opportunities at least to make sure that you're getting value out of those those expenses um, we so we believe that uh, we could do a little bit better on those or eliminate them altogether so with that I'm gonna it's 130 now I'm gonna bring up Eric so again Eric's our venture capitalist partner Eric Quisenberry and he's just gonna speak to our partnership and relationship If you have any questions, we invite you to go ahead and ask while he's, while he's on with us. How does Eagle Ridge get so many rounds? Uh, T sheet management, the general manager there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is it right? Did you ask that question? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's T sheet management. It's uh, the, the general manager there. Use your microphone so everybody can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. The general manager there. His name is Del Smotter. He's uh, a mentor to me and and many other of the operators. Uh, sees every day as an opportunity to book tea times, and it's his job to book them, and that's what he does. Uh, he doesn't rely on anyone else. He provides the service and the experience, and it comes from his leadership. And uh, the community supports the club. They have supported the club. Uh, Seventy percent of the, uh, the, the the rounds there are played by the community. So, um, is, is it the com competition for the club comparable to what we have? We have what six, five or six horses here. Yeah, the villages there are, are, are pretty stiff competition for us. So, yeah, the village is 120,000 and growing. That's right down the road. That's only a few miles down the road. So they do uh, provide, uh, I think they have three or four golf courses. So there will always be competition. We've seen, 
especially over the course of the last six, eight months, that demand for golf has increased. So um, throughout all of our facilities, we've, uh, we've really tried to maximize that opportunity. So from the... From what I saw through the end of August, uh, we just see a lot of potential here in capturing more tee times. Even recognizing that these are given. Are yeah, those. Yeah, we did review those as well. Are basically given tee times that need to be handled. Yes, we did review that as well. Yes, you can still. Yeah, we still see opportunities. Now we don't. We don't have the tee sheets. We haven't looked at. We don't have access to the t exact tee sheets every day. But the nature of our decision making is to sell those tea times, yeah, and we have today to sell the tea times. So uh, Dale operates with 36 different tea sheets available, depending on the day and the groups that are playing. So um, we see for 36 holes, we we think there could be an opportunity. There is also opportunity on the average dollar per round, which has gone down seven dollars over the course of the last four years. We believe there are opportunities there as well. So, does Eagle Ridge do from. much with shotguns? Yes, he does do shotguns. He does does do double T's. He also does shotguns. So we did discuss some of uh, those details, opportunities. Um, I I believe, and and correct me if I'm wrong. There is a, at this point there is one member of course and one outside uh, play course. Or is that not the no, case? No, that's not okay. the case. Okay. So in that case, that's that's. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, we would need to fill shotguns at eight o'clock with daily fee golfers. So that would, um, on when the, depending on the day, there are a number of groups. But each day we would each day we would look at opportunities and build tee sheets and maximize that uh, maximize the tee sheet on a daily basis. And who, whose responsibility is that going to be? Would that be? I'm sorry. Head pro, general manager. It's philosophy, well, and it comes from all of us, really, on a on a corporate level. That is that drives our profitability. Tee times. Yep. Yep. And I'm uh, director of revenue as well for the company. So my office is in Orlando, and in our office, we also help with tee sheet management. Um, and it's def we definitely leave it up to the general manager to be involved in that process, but they can also use our office as a resource. Um, that's my background, uh, TC management, dynamic pricing. So, do we want to just stay on? Yeah, that's fine. Um, we'll touch on some more of the TC management and some technology as well. So that uh, will give you a, another uh, a layer of of how we do and what we do. We'll just continue on. I haven't heard from Eric, so we'll just continue on at this point. Okay, so this is uh, total club performance uh, comparison between the two clubs. I have I have taken out capital purchases, capital leases, golf car payments, lease payments. I've taken them out and and shown a a comparison over the last four years for a light club at Eagle Ridge, which has uh, had a positive EBITDA of. Uh, 3.9 million compared to an operating loss of uh, 963,000. So that's the difference, and 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 that's done every day. We do we we make decisions on cash flow and uh, the importance of maximizing the tee sheet and watching our costs to the penny every day. So that'll give you the idea there. And again, this is a, a comparison uh, the year to date total in 2020. Uh, we've had a lot of success in 2020 with increased demand, and um, and, it, and it shows there, uh, which is it's kind of, it's been a really a banner year there. So that is that last uh, this year is an 11th month comparison there. So um, we're we're excited to to show this. Uh, the club performance at Eagle Ridge is exceptional, um, and we think that uh, given the opportunity, we can have similar. 
similar goals. I did put together the pro formas, um, and I think the opportunity there uh, here at, at Sun and Lake is uh, is to be profitable. So I went down. <clears throat> Thank you guys both for uh, letting me go to Eagle Ridge, and uh, I, I hope that uh, there are the other supervisors at one time can at least go up there and. Because your facility up there is so much like ours. And uh, I was impressed with uh, your, your uh, general manager there is quite a quite a guy. And uh, I, I visited the maintenance facility. I, I visited, uh, but I, I just, uh, it, the growth of the Del Webb thing is Del Webb builds it and gets the heck out, right? Is that basically what they do? Yeah. And he told me the story about um, Club Corps that came in, was hired by Del Webb, I guess, mm-hmm. and wor- wasn't doing so well, so they 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 got you guys. Uh, and he told me at one time your revenue in the food and beverage was 430000 And last year before COVID, it was 900 and something. So, and... <coughs> And what I thought about it, it's he, he, his secret was the community, like we have, to get involved in their own restaurant. And he said, and you could see it, I drove by it, the villages, and there's unbelievable amount of golf courses and places to eat. So I could see the challenge. And he said, last, even with COVID, uh, last year you did 700000 which I, I, I think is, is pretty good, but... Uh, I just want to thank you guys both because I know you're involved in getting me up there. Uh, just to let you know, it's 230 miles round trip. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's Eagle Ridge is is quite like Sun Lake. So. So thanks again. Yes, thanks. Thanks for taking that opportunity, Mike. We're glad to showcase uh, Eagle Ridge, and and Dale is extraordinarily sharp. So thanks for yeah. thanks for taking taking the opportunity and going up there. We we really appreciate that. Can we invite anybody else who would like to go? To we have another club in Orlando. It's a, it's a resort uh, that's owned by Holiday and Timeshare. So uh, and that's where Bryce Off is out of. We can set that up as well if that helps in any decision making um, that's that's coming up here. Uh, we'd love to host. So all you have to do is just let me know. I don't quite understand why you took all of the capital purchase leases, golf cart payments, and lease payments out to do your calculation. If those were included, what does that do to that graph or that chart? It's it was hard for me to the capital purchases at both clubs. We make capital purchases at Eagle Ridge, so we make at both facilities. I'm sure you do here. They were not. I, I did not see them in the RFP information, so um, I, I didn't take into consideration any capital purchases. We show the capital purchases on our financials. So um, the capital leases, as far as um, equipment and golf carts, we actually have our golf carts are under our capital lease. Um, and so, so are a lot of our equipment. Yeah, we, we are, our golf cars are. And actually, um, we did send some information, and, and you'll get that here uh, in our questionnaire that we had sent. They are under capital lease, and we can review that as well. Um, and so the golf car payments as well, we, we took them out just because uh, we didn't have that information. I understand that the district uh, uh, has that cost, but it doesn't show in the financials that we received putting together the RFP. So I really tried to make an, uh, an apples-to-apples comparison there. So, yep. Uh, this is another comparison. This is a comparison of, of uh, Letter Rock. We did send a video from the general manager. This was previously a, a Billy Casper Indigo run facility, and I just wanted to show that comparison. Uh, this is um, Letter Rock is located in, in Pennsylvania, 18 holes, 200 acres, uh, 250 luxury homes surround the, the golf course. Uh, the township. This is uh, this is another uh, facility owned by the township. It was opened in 2006. Uh, this year they started a double T concept, which uh, has helped with rounds and revenue. Um, and as you'll see in the club's performance over the last couple of years, uh, the rounds ha- have been up, um, as well as the average dollar per round has gone up there. 
over the last two years. Uh, we do have a community uh, outreach there. We do a lot of rounds from leagues. And they also have food and beverage and a banquet facility. So we manage this uh, for the township. Uh, so this basically just summarizes the profitability that um, where it was in 2017 and then as we took over in two, the, all the way to the right is 2019 and then the last 12 months, November. So as you can see, the club's performance rounds uh, have increased, uh, especially the last 12 months. Membership has gone down a little bit, uh, but our green fee, card fee has uh, gone up considerably. Uh, food and beverage has gone down, um, and then total revenue, as you can see, has increased. The net profitability, net income from uh, 2017 to last 12 months, as you can see, has grown 306% from uh, 146 to 592. So um, I just wanted to show that as an example uh, in comparison. Um, this is, again, this is a, a township owned facility. Yes, Greg. The membership loss there. <clears throat> the membership loss, is that related to uh, members not any, having availability to their tea times that they wanted before or that were there before? Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, what the, uh, again, we, th we believe it's very important to have a balance between membership, membership rates, and availability of tea times to the public. We believe there's a balance. We believe the community is very, very important. So some of those memberships and some of that membership decline could be playing less frequently or, pay, or paying to play as they play. So um, the green fee car fee number is, is again for profitability and for having a sustained asset is important. All those numbers are important and total revenue is, is crucial. Um, so, so yeah, and, and to touch on that too, um, when we went into that property, so we do what's called a rev pad analysis or revenue per available tee time. Um, so we drip, we take all the revenue, we figure out what basically each day part is is worth per tee time on your tee sheet, and then we take that average and we look at the membership, how often they're playing, and you know what the membership fees are. Um, and at Letter Rock, we were averaging, or they were averaging a very uh, nice cost per round outside of membership, but the membership rate was very low. So we did raise the membership. A, a good amount, and that's I think uh, you know the, the membership revenue is representation of that. So a lot of people elected not to renew their membership, but the increase in green fee and cart fee revenue uh, shows that we were kind of able to backfill those times with public rounds. Um, this was just on a letter rock basis. Like I wouldn't, you know, we don't, we wouldn't normally go in and, and uh, necessarily raise, you know, recommend they raise the membership prices considerably. But it did make sense at this particular property, um, and and that's I think the reason that that those numbers look the way they do. So <clears throat> you made those recommendations to increase the cost of membership to who? The township. So and and part of so this is a township deal. Yeah. yeah, and and part of we we're, we we want to facilitate as much information to make the leadership to provide you with uh, as much information so you can make the best possible decisions. And that's it. We can manage around any expectation that you'd like, but we're going to be transparent in the way we operate. We're going to be we're going to give you all the information. This this information here. Um, was presented to the township, and ultimately they're they're going to make the final decision. And uh, we have relationships where uh, the owners are totally hands off, and we have relationships where we're very close. So, and I know the township in this particular is very close uh, with with how we operate as well. Um, you'll also get an, uh, another. You, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see if Eric can put together the partnership there with some of our own facilities, and then. Um, You'll also get a video from the general manager at Letter Rock that we uh, he was more than happy to put together um, 
a, a video presentation so you could see that from some of the, the transitions between uh, one company to the other. Um, but yes, the township would make the ultimate decision. And how often do you have these type of meetings with the township? Uh, well, as often as the township would like. I mean, that's uh, the nice thing about being a small company. Well, I mean, something company. like this, you're coming to them and you're saying, you know, we're gonna, we want you to raise it, whatever. Yeah, typically during the budget process, we would make recommendations as far as... Uh, you do it during budget? Yeah. So once a year, possibly? Yes. As far as daily fee rates, we try to... Uh, you'll, you'll see some of the technology. We're managing that on a daily basis. But some of the larger scale programs and... Um, obviously, these are going to have impacts. If we increase, decrease, they're going to have impacts on the community and the members as a whole. So we want to make sure we're doing the right thing for everyone. So, But making those decisions will have an impact on the financial performance, and, and we're going to share all that information <coughs> transparently to make sure you can make a good decision. Yes, Mike. PJ, when I was there, I was uh, talking to Dale, and, and we, I, I, he introduced me to the head pro. <coughs> and then... I noticed that the head pro was at the was taking money with one assistant, and it's small. I mean, we have a lot bigger pro shop than they do. And then I walked outside with him, and I never seen so many. It must have been Women's Day, but it was like here on Women's Day or Women's Morning, and all I saw was Rangers and Stars, and they were controlling everything and. But is that normal? Is that the normal operation that inside, nice and quiet, nice bar, nice everything, and you walk out and it's just, and they were under control, they controlled everything, your starters and your, but is that, is that a two-person pro shop? Uh, Most that's time? a well little machine, and uh, yeah, yeah I, you're, you're absolutely right. And that golf shop, I've seen it very, very busy when we're double teeing first thing in the morning. And yeah, yeah you, you got to get 500 golfers on the golf course somehow, and they're coming into the golf shop. So, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very hands on operation, and that's what we expect at all our clubs. Okay. I mean, that's important. It's important uh, from a customer <laughs> service standpoint. And uh, yeah, there are definitely times, especially if you're doing shotguns, where every, it's all hands on deck for you know a small window of time it's very similar to food and beverage it's you know you have blocks of times I think of it as a bubble you got to stay ahead of the bubble and you know the bubbles coming and, and that's important so yeah we'll utilize all our resources including Dale Dale would be the first person to answer the phone or yeah. pick up a bag from the yeah. from somebody pulling up and uh, you know that's just a general culture that we have and I really think that translates into customer service and if the boss is doing it then you know everybody's doing it if I made the statement members come first no exceptions no exceptions yeah members do come first yeah yeah and especially uh, 70 especially here at Eagle Ridge which is comparable 70 percent of the play does come from the membership yes and we're very community based we've grown our we've grown a lot of uh, Avenues. We've grown a lot of the revenue streams uh, from the membership. Tea time program. Yeah, I think uh, again, you know, the ultimate decision on on pricing is going to be determined by you all as as we present it. So uh, again, it's a it's a it's an important balance in making available tea times that will sell at a premium available, and then having an affordable, attractive membership. So. Um, yeah, I mean, there is a balance. So I, I don't know uh, what that balance is. Right now, um, we believe that based on the number of rounds, that there is opportunities to maximize the T-sheet um, and keep the membership times available. So we would, explore, we would explore that. We would hit the ground running, and we would make sure that every day we would uh, maximize the revenue around the member play. If I'm just curious. It's a great statement to make. Sounds good. How you do it? Somebody's going to get. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I'm going to wrap up. I'm going to hand it over to Bryce, and he's going to go through a, a, a cool technology that we have that we've built and some of our thought processes on a daily basis. So yeah, we're going to touch on that right now. Um, yeah, well, you can go ahead. The membership at Eagle Ridge when you took over. 
I, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I know that the uh, the community has uh, continued to support the club as we've owned the facility, but I don't know I don't know what that was. Um, but 70% 70, 70 of the rounds at Eagle Ridge are for members. That's correct, yep. Or, or the community, it's 3,500 homes, so uh, some are members, or I think there are, between the seasonal members and the total members, maybe 350 members total, so um, it, the community and the membership make up that 70%. And then we have, also we have outside play, outside of the direct community of Eagle Ridge, about 30% make up the other, uh, make up the, the daily fee play. Okay, so um, I want to touch on kind of the sales and marketing approach from, a, I guess, a more digital standpoint um, for Sun and Lake. Uh, I did see, so Sun and Lake is listing inventory on golfnow.com, um, and that is in the form of a barter agreement. So I, I saw one tee time for sale, uh, one hot deal for sale, um, which is a barter tee time, and the revenue from that tee time is, is paid to golf now. Um, I would estimate the opportunity cost on that one barter time is is probably costing about forty six thousand dollars annually, um, and you know that that's just, I would I don't I don't know this information, but I would just want to look at your distribution channel analysis and know how many paid at course rounds are coming from that channel versus you know what we're giving up in barter. Um, the the barter time as well could be paying for some technology. I'm not sure if it is, but a lot of times what Golf Now will do is they'll provide a website or um, a booking engine or uh, and as well as Golf Now distribution uh, for those barter times. What, and just to touch on that as well, I did see that from a pricing standpoint, the price was low. The, the price was lower on Golf Now to play Sun and Lake than it was on your course website. Um, it would we believe that it's you're, you should try to drive people to your course website. So you know, golfers when they're booking a tee time, first they think, where do I want to play? Second thought is, where can I get the best deal? Right. Well, in this case, where do you want to play? Sun and Lake. Where can you get the best deal? It would be on Golf Now. Um, it, this is the this example is Monday morning. The rate on golf now is forty two dollars, and the rate on your course website was fifty dollars. So it would be our recommendation that your best available rate would be through a channel where you own one hundred percent of the revenue. Um, another uh, another thing about golf now is all of the data from the tee times that are sold from golf now, all the customer data. What they do is they take that customer data and then they remarket other barter times in your competitor courses to, you know, to basically to your customers. Uh, so that's just another reason that you want to try to drive customers away from. The, well, you want to drive customers to channels where you own 100% of the data, as opposed to, um, you know, Golf Now using those your customers' information to market hot deals in your competitor tee times as well. Um, because of a lot of the things that I'm discussing here, Brown Golf actually decided to invest in our own technology platform and bring a lot of those pieces that Golf Now was providing in house. Uh, so we created a technology platform. It's called Golfback or GolfbackSolutions.com is the name of the website if you want to take a look at it. But the core principles of Golfback are that the golf course must own its customer data, the golf course must own its lowest rate, the golf course must automate processes and rely on real data, and the golf course must maximize revenue in high demand windows. So what tools specifically did we build? Um, we built lead generating websites in-house. So we saw that that was a, a you know, line item on the expense sheet. Um, again, these other companies, they will use a, a vendor to provide those services, whereas we actually build them. Uh, I, I actually build them in-house for, uh, for the facilities we manage and own. Um, we have an advanced booking engine. This booking engine has a lot of very cool components for both the golf course and for the for the user. Um, we have a dynamic pricing algorithm built into the back end of the engine. So what does that mean? It basically means that the rate the online rate of the online tee time is fluctuating up and down based on different demand factors. Um, those demand factors obviously include how busy you are, so what's your tee sheet utilization in that day part, but also uh, things like weather and what your competition is doing as well. 
Um, again, we, we, we've built that in-house, and all of our facilities use that technology as just a part of, of being a Brown Golf client. And then we also have an automated e email marketing tool, which not to get you know too much in the weeds, but basically what we do is we take all of the data that's flowing through your website and your booking engine. So anytime a customer is interacting with any of these tools, we're taking that data and it's funneling into the CRM tool, and then we build automations around that information. Basically, to put it simple, we're trying to take what we know about that customer and when they like to play, how much they typically spend, how many players they usually book for, how far out they book. We take all of this data that we know about them and then it funnels into our CRM tool where we build automated email marketing messages that go out to those customers based on what we know about them. So, yeah, you know, you asked kind of a question. It's, it sounds great as far as Dale and T-Sheet management, and, um, but how do you do it? This is, this is one scenario. So if you wanted to book a tee time at Eagle Ridge, it's not available on Golf Now, but it is available through the channels that, that we own 100% of the margin. But margin aside, the main thing is, is that that customer data is owned by us, and we're taking it, and then we're trying to funnel those customers through channels that are the most profitable for us or for the golf course. So this is like a website, Golf Back? It's not a third-party aggregate website, so it's not like golfnow.com. There, there's no, you know, golfback.com where you'll find uh, tee times for 25 different golf courses. This is so. This is just to think like direct to the club. So we would build websites, lead generating websites for Sun and Lake. We would build the booking engine out for Sun and Lake, and Sun and Lake would be using our automated CRM tool as well. So when somebody called or got on the internet to book a tea time with Sun and Lake, Golf Back would show up? It would. So right now on your on your website, um, you're using a booking engine that's provided by your point of sale system, IBS. Um, we instead of that instead of paying IBS for that technology, we would implement our own technology that we've developed. So you're not, you know, it's, it's in house, you're not you're not paying a vendor for that. So if somebody wants to go book a tea time at Sun Lake, they go to Sun Lake's website and book the tea time directly. That's correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you capture information on both members and public. We do. Yep. So we would have a member booking engine as well as a public booking engine. Um, the member booking engine would probably be password protected, so you know, just someone from the public couldn't go and book a zero dollar tea time. Uh, but yeah, we would we would provide that service for members. Uh, we you know, and I could get into the weeds about this, but we can offer several different customizable rate types as well. So you know, if you had members that were, could book at one rate, that and then members that book at a different rate, we could facilitate all of that. Um, I did see too in the the marketing program uh, that was included in the RFP, there was a slide about. Golf Now rounds at Sun and Lake, and it was only through June, I believe. Um, but those rounds were down. But I just thought that I think there were 240 rounds sold through GolfNow.com for the year, and if Golf Now sells that barter time every day for their own profit, so they're selling 120 rounds a month of barter where the paid at course rounds are only 220 so I would just encourage you to look at that relationship and, and determine if, if it's really in the best interest of, of the golf facility um, you know we have clubs we, we, we do this for and some of them you know they're, they're pumping a lot of rounds that paid at course rounds through golfnow.com but others uh, golf now is selling substantially more barter times than they are paid at course times so, so 250 rounds equates to like $45,000 no, it's per month. Yeah, so they're selling 120 barter rounds per month. Um, and, and when we talk about opportunity costs, you got to think of it more from what the standpoint of if you had to sell that tea time and you priced it at a discount like they're pricing it at, how often could you sell it? You would sell it a lot. And that, that's something that our office helps with, right? It is um, our technology provides those pricing tools to help you make sure that you're selling the right tea time 
at the right price to the right golfer. If that makes sense. You know, I can ask that the obvious dumb question is I come in on a Tuesday, I'm the general manager, I look at the tee sheet, got holes all over the place. How do I tell them? I still don't get that far. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different data inputs that go into that, but ideally, if your Tuesday mornings are generally slow, we would have automatically already sent an email blast out to the price sensitive customers in our database to try to fill that Tuesday morning. So whether we're in incentivizing them by price or incentivizing them by um, added value, right? We're, we're taking the slow times in our T-sheet and we're segmenting our customer database and then putting promotions in front of those customers that appeal to them, make sense to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then you would be possibly selling it at less than your listed price, correct? Well, it, it, that's okay if you sell them three times as many. You know, it, it's it's just uh, it, it's there's there's a lot of data data analysis that goes into that. So it's hard to say. Well, we wouldn't sell as many if the price was lower. But it's our it would be our job to analyze that and say, well, if we do dump the price, we're not going to sell any more than we normally do. So we're not going to do that, right? That would be an analysis that that we make. So, do you have any idea what our potential is based on? your way of doing things with the tee sheet? I, I don't know how big the golfer database is, but I would imagine it's it's pretty large. Um, but knowing that information would, would give me a lot more, um, give me an idea of, of what that could be. But I, I know just from looking at what is currently happening with the online pricing and with um, the pricing on third-party channels, that there is room for significant improvement, even if um, you know, even if the data, the golfer database is that large. And then there are things that we can also do with our tools to do a better job of collecting and adding to that database, so that as we go forward, that database grows. You want to talk on this one? Or? So the. This uh, this slide here is um, it's going to just about wrap us up here, but these are just immediate action items that we would look to do um, right off the bat. Um, we would do a full cost expense analysis, and again, for a club that does three and a half million dollars in total revenue, that it, all those expense lines would be drilled down to the dollar. And and I really think uh, at three and a half million dollars of revenue. There are there is a lot of opportunity on the expense side, so uh, we do believe that there is opportunity on the revenue side as well. But uh, on the expense side, we we, we really do. Um, the audit of the food and beverage menu and pricing um, that would be important. Uh, securing all alcohol inventory and doing either weekly or biweekly inventory counts. Fifty percent alcohol cost of goods sold is just really high. And uh, when you add that up year over year, it adds up. So just uh, just to kind of get an intimate with the inventory, as we say, is, is really important, making sure uh, pour sizes are correct and overpouring is not taking place and the prices are, are priced accordingly. Um, the use of golf back uh, to build the tools in-house as, as Bryce went over, and using that technology and not relying on others to sell your tee times. You have a good product, you can look online, the ratings are very good, people enjoy the golf course, um, you should be capturing 100% of that revenue and, um, and eliminating the, the uh, third parties from selling tee times. We've made that decision company-wide and we've had a lot of success with it. Um, we'd audit all the leases and equipment. As far as the equipment that's on lease, making sure um, the quality of cut there, the integrity is there, especially on the, the golf equipment. Um, we audit the tee sheet immediately um, and do uh, do the analysis as that that price went over. And then on a, on a food and beverage standpoint, again, just we we do with with our technology, we can do a lot of surveys. We believe in surveys. We want to know the feedback from the community, what they want, and try to um, to roll that out uh, over the. This would be a 30, 60, 90 day. Um, Action items here that we would uh, that we would go through. Um, 
So the difference between us and every what makes us different is again I, I want to reiterate this is the cash flow. We, we, we own the cash flow at our own facilities and it's very important. Uh, and then we take that cash flow and we reinvest back into the club uh, and, and, and self sustain, the clubs are self sustaining. Um, we've had other transitions similar to a transition that similar to this transition that could be if it does come to fruition uh, we've seen a lot of successes as uh, we've told the story about letter rock there in pennsylvania um, we feel like we're wired differently just because we own clubs and 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 we're not just managing for a fee we, we really feel like um, we make decisions that are different and we make decisions for profitability and um, that's an, that's very important for us. We do have a small uh, corporate footprint, um, and it's really one-on-one. -on -one. I'm a half a day's drive here, and um, I would be the main point of contact uh, for all for all uh, transition and operations. So I, I would I would be available. I've, I've, I'm make my myself available every day. I'm, I'm about four hours away, so it's a drive down. And then we additionally we have a corporate office in Orlando. So um, that, that wraps up. Just a couple, couple other uh, things as far as the, the presentation and kind of extensions. You will get two videos, one from the owner of Royal Manchester, which is uh, independently owned. It's not a municipal run golf course. Um, he put together a video for us. They recently went from a transition. Um, we did, uh, I, I think Omar's going to uh, distribute that. We can, yeah, we can play. This is Frank Cosa. He is uh, one of the partners at Royal Manchester. So we'll go ahead and play Frank's video. Hello, my name is uh, Frank Cosa, and uh, I'm with Talent Energy. Uh, we're an independent power producer located in uh, Houston and uh, Pennsylvania, Allentown, Pennsylvania, to be exact. Um, we went. spun off from uh, PPL uh, probably three years ago. Uh, this course has been around for 10 years. It's a link style course um, uh, built on fly ash next to one of our uh, uh, power plants. Um, I guess we uh, were introduced to Brown Golf when we were uh, making a uh, thinking about a management change of the course. Uh, the course prior was managed by a, uh, a company that uh, was was in place for over ten years. Uh, they were also the architects of the course. Um, unfortunately, it became. Uh, I think there was a little complacency there, and for us, uh, being not in the golf game per se. Um, you know, we it, there wasn't a lot of focus, um, but with uh, all of our assets, we uh, wanted to run this one and, and let it become profitable again. Um, you know, so we we looked to a few different companies, as you are uh, going through the same uh, uh, process right now, and uh, we chose uh, John and the Brown Golf team. Uh, to run our uh, property. Uh, obviously, we are not a, a year-round uh, property. We, it being in north, you know, northeast Pennsylvania, uh, we do have some very slow months in the winter. Um, but uh, we went with uh, Brown Golf. We chose them, I guess, probably in the winter, January, February time frame of 2018. Uh, they took over in May. And uh, the first year, you know, we had some challenges with... Um, with the transition, as, as you would expect, uh, we had some liquor license issues that we had to work through, uh, kind of doing a new management team, and uh, it, it all went smoothly, uh, although it took a little longer than we wanted to. So we were really looking forward to 2020 being our first real uh, year uh, under Brown management, um, and then COVID hit. So again, we had some more challenges, mostly related to the food and beverage area, but I got to say, from a golf standpoint, once we were able to open, again, this is Pennsylvania, um, we had a lot of restrictions placed on us. So once we were able to open, I, I have to say we've had a very good year given the challenges. 
Um, and I still don't think we've seen the best out of our course or, uh, you know, for that, for that uh, sense, the Brown management team, um, given the restrictions that we've had to deal with. And uh, so we, we, we moved to them. Uh, this year we had, uh, you know, a great financial success. We went from 10 years of making quarterly investments into the property to this is, uh, I want to say, this is the first time ever we've gotten a dividend out of the course. And uh, as a management team focused on, uh, you know, other aspects of our core businesses, um, that's tremendous. Um, we've been very happy with uh, the Brown team, uh, the personnel changes, uh, they're very adaptive to our constraints and our needs and um, have done a, a really tremendous job as far as transparency and sort of their just straightforward approach to making recommendations and suggestions and having a uh, very, very good conversation because we both want the same things. We both uh, want to be super successful given the constraints that we do have in that locale. Um, so I, I think, you know, from a financial standpoint, we've seen um, 100% turnaround uh, in, uh, in, in EBITDA and revenue growth. I think their attention to detail, given the, uh, you know, sort of uh, managing the T-sheet better, focusing on our uh, inventory turn, um, things like that, as well as making... You know, while we've cut expenses and we've changed personnel and we're running efficient, more efficiently, we are still making commitments uh, on the capital side. Uh, we've made strategic investments in asset injection systems based on their recommendations on various mowers, um, gas carts, things like that that have really helped us focus our energy on the course and making it a good experience for uh, the golfers. We're right next to one of our power plants. We have an employee system in place and uh, community outreach that the, the Brown Golf team uh, has procured with some of the local colleges and high schools. So um, it's a positive for the community. It's a positive now for the company financially, and it's a positive for the company uh, from an employee relations standpoint to offer uh, a beautiful course. I mean, I think it's a top three-rated course in the, in the state of Pennsylvania, and um, we couldn't be happier with our decision. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend uh, Brown Golf and, uh, you know, John and his team, uh, very professional at the management level, uh, all the way down to who we have working at the course. So um, I wish you guys good luck in, in your decision making. Uh, we were there two years ago, and I have to say we, uh, we couldn't be happier with what we've uh, seen from uh, John and his team. So uh, thank you very much, and happy holidays. <coughs> Yeah, just just a minute, and we'll get to the public too. The, the the first question I would have is: We've heard a lot about oops, the um, economic benefits that you bring. That uh, the financial management and uh, business management seems good. Talk to us a little bit about your agronomic management. Yeah, we have a director of agronomy. Um, we have uh, corporate relationships with Howard's uh, Fertilizer and Chemical. Um, we, we believe that the golf course needs to be uh, as good as it possibly can be. So um, the, the performer that I put together, I think, as far as a, uh, the cost structure there, would get it there as far as a labor and... Um, an expense side, but we believe strongly that the golf course is the the lifeline, and it needs to be exceptional on a daily basis. So um, we have an intranet site that provides the um, all of our superintendents with uh, a lot of resources. Uh, we do, I believe, we do a really good job between the nine, 19 facilities of interdepartmental communication on what's working and what's not working, but. Uh, we're going to practice all of the cultural practices. We believe in investing into the golf course, uh, all the cultural practices between um, mole cricket apps, uh, 
aerifications, additional top dressing, quality of, of, of the turf, uh, soil samples, nematode assays, all of, the, I mean, the cultural practices and practice on a daily basis, we, uh, we have high standards uh, throughout, throughout the, the uh, portfolio. So those are, it's at the top of the list. So those are high expectations there. Yep. And then how about, um, how, how would you envision staffing coming in? Would you be using our staff or would you be bringing in your own staff? Uh, from previous experiences, we've, we would provide everybody the opportunity to interview uh, for the position that they have when we go through the transition process. Uh, from my experience throughout uh, the managed facilities, we have retained a lot of the, the current staff. Uh, we believe our processes and procedures are better on a daily basis than our mindset, and that's a culture, and we believe that, uh, that I'm sure there are great people here that uh, provide great service, and that's really, really important and extraordinarily knowledgeable. And I think through our processes and procedures and our culture, I think um, there would be an opportunity to continue to flourish. So uh, we, would, we, would, we would really, through a transition, we would... Uh, Give every one of the staff members an opportunity um, to to join the Brown Golf Team. Okay, uh, P PJ, I have a just a quick a quick question. I was going to ask you. I don't know if I told you, but I visited all three of the applicants to their facilities, and I had several questions. But my first question to them to the general managers, which they really couldn't answer, but they give me a what's usually done at our course and so on <clears throat> but it kind of like a two part question is I, it's important to me to try to keep our employees, it really is I mean, but it's up to you to, <laughs> to uh, pick them or choose them but, and train them and train them and I would like for you to keep everyone that you possibly could because that's I'm just one out of five. But if if you got the thing, I would like you to keep them all. And then if some might not stay, I, I understand that they they've been with Indigo for years and they might want to stay. But I would like you to at least give them all a chance, including our general manager. Uh, but again, that's up to you. I, I try not to get too much involved in, and we can't telling you who you can hire and fire us board of supervisors we go we try to go through tanya but i but one of my problems with indigo was when we do have a a, a replacement that wants to go or for one reason or another we don't seem to get a good replacement and that's happening sometimes but that's only my opinion i mean some other people might argue with me but uh it's important to me as a voter and who does that you try to keep our employees that you like or at least give them a chance I don't mind what you do afterwards but it's just something I needed to tell you how I feel and uh, the rest is up to you but uh, that, that would be important to me and I asked several questions to every one of you proposers and uh, that was my first one so I, I just wanted to let you know what, how I feel and I do want an answer do you have people at Brown Golf that could give us a good replacement if we needed one? Uh, well, we wouldn't uh, entertain that until we would go through a transition process. So, yeah, let, um, let, let me see if I can clarify. I think what Mike was trying to get at is about a year ago, our GM left and Indigo brought in or tried to bring in potential replacements for him. And there weren't very many replacements to choose from. And we, we used Mike. Mike has been here for a long time. We knew Mike. And, you know, I don't think Mike has a, a level of experience, but he's got a lot of positive skills. I think he's very trainable. Um, but in a, in a situation where we lose a key employee, we're asking, do you have a good resource to replace that employee to help That's us? That's what I basically want. Yeah, and we have a lot of great success stories with with uh, individuals within Brown Golf. We have approximately 500 total staff members, 550, that, including myself, who have uh, wanted to assume more responsibility, and we've 
set the culture and train them up. And, and we have a lot of people internally that I think want to take the next step. And those are those. So yes, potentially, um, we would we would uh, for all positions throughout all of our company. And so yeah, but people is and, and staff is is extraordinarily important. That's that's my background. I'm going to fight for all of the staff every day um, and try to uh, maximize that relationship. I really believe strongly in that. I. That's just the way I operate every day. I think that's important. So, um, those those, if given the opportunity, those decisions would be uh, pretty much coming from me, and and I don't I take them very seriously. And um, it's a people business, and I think you have to treat people right and um, provide the opportunities to everybody here. So that's how I feel about that. I want to go back one more time on this. Group listing. Can you give us the? Can you use your you mic? Abide by these groups on our T sheets, because I under, if I take it right, you guys own the T sheet. If you were to come in. Oh. Uh, well, we would. would yeah. We would implement uh, golf back. We would analyze all this. So we've already looked at this. I've talked to that length with Dale, who's a wizard of tee times. Um, he would be part of a transition team as well. We would analyze that, and we would provide everyone here with the analysis of how we would maximize. For example, like a Tuesday. A Tuesday, you have an 8 o'clock shotgun and then a 1 o'clock shotgun. I'm guessing that's on one golf course and then straight tee on the other golf course. There are two others. If I'm I'm pretty sure that's what that breaks yeah. down to, right? That's what Is we that, do. I think it's a... I, I don't know the names, but... Um, yeah. So we would, we would seek to run a straight tee on the one, and then if the members, I'm guessing that this is a social, just like Eagle Ridge, it's very social, you want to start, you want to end together, you want to have a pitcher of beer, you want to have lunch, so that's the reasons for the shotgun, I'm guessing. We would try to fill the shotgun at 8 o'clock with other players, and then we would try to fill this, the, the straight tee with as much public play as possible. That would be our first initiative. If we weren't able to sell the eight o'clock shotgun, which maybe it's difficult, we have to do. We, we would have to determine that. If we weren't able to sell it, if there are let's say forty players in that shotgun, there is a lot of room on the other golf course to expand on that, right? So we can sell other tee times at eight o'clock. The price point may be some kind of promotional rate to get them to the golf course and play, um, or we could add add value to those tee times. But we would seek to do our absolute best of working around that list. I did Mondays, Mondays seem like an interesting day for sure with the reverse shotgun. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Um, I would have to see it, but I'm confident that we're gonna, we're gonna come to you with, there could be a compromise here or there on particular days. We're not going to, we wouldn't, we're not in the business of saying membership, too bad, this is, this is what it's going to be. That's, we're going we're gonna to analyze everything, provide the information, and see potentially if there was an opportunity, some kind of compensate or some kind of consideration on both, uh, on both parties. But, my background is, is private. I've managed a private club in Pennsylvania. We have about $6 million. We had 550 members, um, 36 holes. It was a member-based club. It was, we did $2.5 million of food and beverage revenue. Uh, it's important. The membership relationship is really important. So we would do everything we could to analyze that, to maximize the T-sheet around it. If we couldn't do it, a compromise, we would come to the membership, try to create a compromise. <clears throat> Do you this also point no compromise? On this issue, there is no compromise. I mean I you might as well know that up front because you don't want to find out the hard part. So uh, well there's uh, that that would be on us. If there is no compromise on this and issue, I don't believe there is. we couldn't fill the tea times 
uh, there could be opportunities to fill tee times around the, the makeup of the group play. And that would be our number one goal. I want to mislead you and actually sure. think that you can come in and possibly renegotiate that bar when I can tell you that most of the members have been promised that they're going to get their, their play when they're supposed to get their play, in, and that's it. And for us to go back and tell them no would not be in our best interest. <laughs> it, would be, it would be an it would be an exception of, of somebody wanting to change what's on here. That is going to definitely be an exception. So basically, these are given that we need to have taken care of. Understood. And you you can fill in all around it. That's fine and dandy. That would be our absolute mission of selling tea times around and, and when I got that I, that was my understanding that's the understanding that's we would do everything possible to, to sell the tea times around those tea times thank you <laughs> now if yeah. I understand it also you would take control of the pricing of our tea times well, a lot of this, the, no, the, yeah so so as far as tea sheet management and pricing, I mean, we're never going to do something that you guys don't want to do, right? I mean, it's uh, we we can certainly make recommendations and say, well, we think that financially this might be a a, a better way to go, or maybe we can try this. But I mean, we're not we're definitely not ever going to just take control of it and and go forward, right? But um. From an online tea time perspective, we have the ability, we have the tools that will fluctuate pricing based on demand. If we don't, if, you know, we don't want to use those tools, that's fine too. I think, you know, just the fact that just from uh, search engine marketing, search engine optimization, um, there's a lot of things we can do outside of pricing to drive, that we think can drive play. Uh, but bottom line is, you know, we're, we're not going to just take the pricing, do what we want with it, and and uh, give no consideration. I mean, it's it's definitely, I think, a, a team effort with not just us at Brown Golf, but with the general manager on staff. And uh, we understand that, you know, they have the relationship with the members. And there's a lot of variables that go into it. So it's not, it's just not that we take control and it is what it is, right? So. Yeah. In your proposal, are there uh, in your mindset? Was there? Are you bringing in uh, outside groups, or uh, what am I looking for? Outings, yes, outings that would maybe shut down the course, both courses. Was that in your? That that wasn't in. Yeah, I mean, there could be opportunities on a day in day out basis, and if people requested uh, a uh, group play of some sort or outing, we'd entertain it. Obviously, knowing that these tea times are locked in, <coughs> I pr yeah. so yeah. But we again, we would try to fill the tea sheet around those times as much as possible at the highest average dollar per round that we could that we could get. So we have outings here too, right? Yeah. Yes. We're not we're not saying that we're perfect. There are times when we understand there's a function, <coughs> it's going to make us money. We have to close a course down. Right. Maybe two. Right. Yeah, and I think those, that those are basically exceptions, though. It's not the rule of thumb. Yes. Right. I mean, it's a great revenue stream, especially for <coughs> food and beverage. So those are all those are those are all important yeah. parts. And right now they can't close both courses at one time they, unless they come here. You couldn't put two outings on two courses at the same time, or the one with both, unless you get permission from the five of us. Perfect. And I'm sure you'd go along with that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. We, again, we, we we manage to the expectation of the district, and we provide the information. If and, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to do it every day, and we're gonna we're gonna attack the revenue streams as much as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's another question. What's our what's our biggest need? I mean, nobody's told me yet what you guys think, or you guys haven't told me yet what you think is the most important thing for you to do with Center Lake. What's our biggest need right now? Cost you controls. Got the numbers you've seen every cost time. controls are your biggest need. Cost control. Yeah. 
Right. We have a lot yeah. of I mean, without knowing, without being here and, and uh, every day uh, uh, and, and the, the service aspect, uh, I, I know I really can't speak to that, but I really feel that uh, just from the information that we, that we got from the RFP is we, we find that there are significant opportunities <coughs> to get more value for less expense. Do I have bigger problems on the golf course or bigger problems on the restaurant side? Um, I think the food and beverage operation has a, a lot of opportunity for improvements between uh, the staffing model. We had lunch today and we had lunch another day. There was significant opportunities on a... Were you the $47 lunch? Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was. Um, so um, so there, I would say... That, I would say the food and beverage would be would be, uh, and we did play as well. But um, the food and beverage standpoint, and we very very much very much like. Although you sell daily fee times, you have a membership and you want that experience. We understand that a renovation to the clubhouse it's important to everyone and the membership to provide a good quality food and beverage. Um, so yeah, that, that that probably would would stand out to me. The the cost controls and the structure and the staffing, uh, that would be that would be up there as the immediate. Okay, so let's say we started on a, a first of a month. How long would it take you to do an evaluation and come back to us with recommendations? Thirty days. Yeah, thirty days is probably enough. Thirty days. Yeah, I mean we would make initial observations pretty quickly, but. We saw it just in having lunch in a couple of days, so. Okay, let me ask you this. I'll get mine out of the way. Uh, the numbers that you submitted call for cost, I'm talking now just food and beverage. Calls for the numbers, uh, the cost of goods sold to be around 34%, labor around 50%, and uh, general expenses around 21 So in my book, that's a loss of 5% to the total revenues. But my question more so is, what percentages do you think we should get to, and how long will it take to get there? I have a question for Omar. Is that the per, was that broken out? I have different numbers on the pro forma. Is that the 60-40 split on the numbers that, they, that was provided in the questionnaire? No. Are you getting those off of the salary range spreadsheet? Well, I don't know which spreadsheet I'm getting. This one here. <laughs> <laughs> I got 85... No, I just did it off of your numbers. I mean, okay. No, this the, this number here. That's our number. Your number that you submitted to us. Our number was thirty-seven percent labor. Thirty-seven percent labor, which is it was, it was thirty-four cost of goods sold, 34. fifty labor, and twenty-one ex general expenses. That's what you gave us. I'm saying that's, in my opinion, maybe a good starting place. But where do you, where should we be, and how long will it take to get there? So 33 to 35 on the food cost side. Bryce, can you pull up the questionnaire? Yeah. Um, 33 to 35 is good for food and beverage. Uh, food maybe a little bit higher. Let's call it 36% and beverage closer to 33, 32%. Um, labor 43% of total revenues. So um, can you just scroll down to the questions here? Uh -huh. I, I did answer some of these. I did send these this morning, so you'll receive these uh, re uh, right up here. Um, actually, I'm sorry. You can scroll down here. Yeah. And uh, and then and then expenses expenses are eight to ten percent. So you'll receive this. We answered all the questions, but just so that you have this, this 33 percent here is a, a, we would do the menu pricing audit. We'd secure the inventory, do inventory counts. Poor stoppers. I'm not sure if you have poor stoppers for all of your. Um, we do have some creative inventory, ways of inventory liquor as well. As when we, uh, every time a shift change happens, we weigh each bottle of liquor to make sure that to the ounce, uh, they're all accounted for. You may, when you add, each keep in mind that every, every. I could say I need you to go to 35 percent on that. <laughs> <laughs> Every percentage point is, is about five thousand dollars, so um, right, it's so important. That one you got us now at eighty six, ninety six. So you you think a a good restaurant operation at Sun Hill Lake could net a profit of four percent? Yeah, or more. Or more. Yeah. 
Yeah. So question yeah. today, are your numbers including G and A? So that's one thing included in our finances now, which goes back to the 60-40 split. We're seeing some of these percentages skewed a little bit because we're tucking into the general manager's labor. Yes, the way, right. We're still not apples to apples? It's, yeah. I, and I did, I did, I do understand, uh, I do understand how it's broken out. Um, but as we, we were, the numbers that we've presented are how food and beverage exclusively operates. So these are the numbers right here. Um, eight to ten percent on the expense side, forty-three percent on the labor side, and thirty-three percent on the food. Right? We do not in, in in the pro formas that we submitted, it's only food and beverage and it's not general administration in those numbers. Well that could be ten to twelve percent, right? Right. And that's my concern is that when you review the RFP when you're looking at, let's say, cost of goods sold or, or labor. Can you, can you use a microphone, Omar? So your assumptions that our current labor is at 50%, it really could be at 45 when we remove GNA. So maybe you have an expectation that you can come in here and cut 5%. We and took the numbers from Billy Casper's uh, financial detail. Okay. Perfect. So those those numbers are apples to apples. Okay, These numbers are, sure. are rock solid as far as that goes. So we, 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 we didn't pull, we pulled those numbers from the detail pages that Billy okay. Casper provided. Perfect. So just, so we're apples to apples then? Yes. Okay. Because those financials that were in the RFP from from uh, Billy Casper are that those those the details in that are exactly how they operated, correct? These percentages are based off our numbers. With That's the yes. GMA. Yep. So These numbers are higher. Yeah. So. Okay. In the RFP, in the uh, in the pro forma that we put together before. Um, this was populated. Uh, we budgeted for 34.6% food costs, 37% on this is just food and beverage uh, labor costs, which is which is aggressive. That's how Eagle Ridge operates, and 8% uh, expense. If you just had food and beverage exclusively, because our labor costs this year was. Uh 77 percent, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So do you think we can get down to 43? When you when when you add in when you when you add in if you when you add in general and administrative expenses, it's going to be higher. It's it's when you add those in as a percentage. It's that's what it boils down to. Okay, if we can kind of wrap up questions from the board, I'd like to open it up to the public in case they have any questions. I just want to say thank you, and uh, you, you guys both are well prepared because uh, I didn't warn you about what you got here. <laughs> so uh, and they ask good questions and are concerned, but thank you for your preparation. Absolutely, and thanks for your due diligence, and, and I wish you the best of luck in your decision making, and we really appreciate the opportunity to come out here. So, okay. thanks thank a lot. you. Any questions from the public? Please come forward to the mic. Tell us who you are. I'm Michelle Murray, and I'm a homeowner here. I also do work for the golf course on Beverage Cart. Um, when you said that 30% you were going to get from outside tea times, you were trying to market 70% from members, 30% from outside tea times. Is that correct? That's the way Eagle Ridge operates currently. The community makes up about 70%, and then we have 30% outside. And what do we? It's about 50 50 split. Okay. Um, the reason that I, I thought of that is because you said apples to apples, but from where Summerfield is, the village is, is nine miles away. Ocala is 15 miles away. Um, population at Summerfield, 25,000. Villages, 88,000. Ocala, 60,000. Here, we are the biggest city anywhere around here at 10,000. Lake Placid is 2,000, which is 16 miles down the road. And Avon Park is 10,000. Oh, we were at 11,000, sorry. So, to say apples to apples, we don't have as many trees. 
<laughs> um, so I don't know. We have to really go outside of it. Mike's saying that it's 200 plus miles to get to your place and back. That is, it's, a, it's 60 miles to get down to Fort Myers. Um, and that's the closest coastal place that I think we could reach. Um, so asking people to come here on a daily basis or on a day is a little less likely if I'm driving nine miles or I've driven 230 miles. So that's all I wanted to say when you guys were trying to compare mm -hmm. on how we were going to get people for a T-sheet. They have a lot more database to go through than us pulling from Lake Placid. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I agree. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I would also say there are a lot more golf courses in the villages in Ocala. So, there, you know, there's, there's more competition, um, certainly, from a, a golf course standpoint, but obviously a lot more people as well. So, um, I, you know, I agree with you. It's not apples to apples for sure. But. Well, they came up here as 14... There's like 14 golf courses within a small range that pulls from all these communities. So there's all 14 of us compared. But a little biased. Sun and Lake is most generally the best kept golf course and the, the best place to come to. Yeah, and I, um, the. That I hear from, yep. that come here about, you know, how things are yeah. kept and everything because they talk to me a lot. Yep. They do agree that we do have the best. Yeah, that's, that's the, not um, bias. That's fact. Yeah, it's not <laughs> even it's not even debatable. <laughs> I have the facts. I'm just saying yeah. people that talk yeah. to me on a daily basis, right. and they come in groups. They tell me, you know, that yeah, oh yeah, we want, always want to come back here. Yeah, that's that's something that's not even debatable. I I think you could go 70 miles, and we're the best. The um your online reputation score is very very good. I think 97 percent on. Yelp and Golf Advisor, so I think you're you're spot on there. Hey, I'm just trying to catch up on my notes here. So, did we get? Are you guys talked about it briefly? The uh, you know we do leases on our equipment and le leases on our carts. How, how do you guys feel about that? And would you want to continue that they if you got? They've got answers on all of the, that we get in an email on. Um, I, I think email. Yeah, so I mean, basically, yeah, for the most part, um, most of our, our low use equipment for agronomy, we try to put on a capital lease if it makes sense and own it um, if it lasts for a, tra a tractor, for example. High use item, we tend to put it on a fair market value lease. And uh, and flip it every four or five years. So a T mower, greens mower, rough unit, fairway unit, all of those would typically be on a fair market value le lease. And then a tractor, an aerifier, um, equipment like that, we would put on a capital lease. So capital leases are typically um, you can get lower rates on them. And here are is with the golf carts in particular, we've actually uh, changed our our philosophy. A little bit, so we actually set up the leases on, on a capital lease with a with a balloon payment at the end, and gas carts hold the residual value for gas carts are higher than electric carts, so we actually have more in residual value than we owe on the balloon payment. So at the end of the lease, uh, we'll be able to we have some options. Uh, we can flip we we can flip the carts and get a new lease. Um, uh, we can. Uh, refinance the carts and uh, we also have the opportunity to sell the carts uh, if we wanted to to a third party so that's what we do these are also in the questions so you'll be able to read through these um, they should be sent out today got time for one more yep <laughs> I think one of the biggest problems we have in the, oh Billy let Billy go sorry go Bill Murray resident I have a concern on the agronomic side of the golf course. Uh, the golf course has been in great shape in the last couple of years. Will you bring in your superintendent, PJ, or how does that work? Great question. The online reputation, from from what I've heard, the golf courses from all, 
pretty much everybody has been. The golf course has been good, so I don't think there's a reason to change anything that's working. Well, but the question is whether the superintendent that's here now is with Indigo, Billy, Gas Billy Casper, will stay, but do you have someone that you could put in that position that would move here with that possibility that that's his job as it, the superintendent? It, it's possible. We, I haven't made any arrangements. No, I know. I know that. But so. do you have people in place for that? We have, we have people as part of a transition team that would be able to assist. Okay. Well, we hope... If right. this person is very well qualified and is doing a great job, that they will continue and work for Brown Golf Club. As I do, too. So um, we hope that's the – if given the opportunity, we hope that's the case. If th that wasn't the case, we would have a transition team, including a director of agronomy, that would come down and facilitate the agronomic practices and work with the staff and uh, – until we found uh, another uh, superintendent. That's my concern. Thank you. Yeah. Well, sorry, I, Bill must not have heard me, but that's what I meant when I said if somebody quits, we need to have capable replacements instead of somebody that you just want to move. So, and that's that's a concern I'm sure to all of us that, and it's not happening now. Sometimes we get what they, what they send us, and I don't want that. I want you to to know that we need top flight people and that's all I ask I totally understand okay. and, and <laughs> it, w it would be great to have you involved in the process I think that's an important process to go through especially with department heads yep. question do you have an email site that uh, we can send uh, and ask for the questions uh, the questions here. Can, you, can you send them to me can you send your questions to me and send I can to forward you, it to and then send is that what you want Okay. I got, I got two more things. Okay. The general manager is going to report to if we were to go with you guys. Your general manager would report to Tanya, but who in your company would would he be reporting to? Me. Yeah. You. Yep. He's PJ Politan, so I'm, I I oversee all the managed facilities, and I work with districts and owners throughout our company. Okay. And then lastly, going back to the restaurant, which obviously I'm very concerned about. One of our biggest problems is we don't have any traffic. What would you guys, just off the cuff, recommend or think about as far as trying to get more people to come into our restaurant? From a, I, we've, I viewed um, the social media posts and um, a lot of the uh, the website and, and to showcase what what's being done. Uh, we would try to theme as much as as we could around holidays, events. Uh, member play, group play that's coming out. We hope to to facilitate an experience that would uh, make everybody on that list in those groups want to come. And, and um, I think consistency, uh, the correct price points, a good experience consistently every day is the number one priority. I think that uh, drives the experience, the social experience, and brings people to the restaurant. So, um, off the top of my head, I, th I, I don't know if I have anything in particular, but I think quality of service, priced right, listening to the members to see what they want would be number one. At your facilities, would you consider yourself affordable family meals, or would you just call it fine dining? Uh, I would say... Um, the former, yeah, I would say the former. So, uh, and just this, this family kind yeah, of meals. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, Eagle Ridge is is a retirement community, uh, and you know, that's that's really important uh, to to make it affordable and uh, the family atmosphere. So, and uh, we create the menus and price points around the demographics of of the community. Some clubs, the, the, some clubs are a lot, going to be a lot different depending on the demographics and what's palatable for the membership and 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 the play. So, it's a case to case basis. Uh, Dale said Dale said it come from the people in your community. Uh, once they changed the menu, got them in the place. Once every, a lot of people came back. So it's it's Dale and Dale, and Dale was involved in. I guess he's been there 21 years. Yeah. So. He said it was. It, it's it's a hard thing to do, but you got to find out what kind of community you have, what kind of pricing 
there is and get people in there and hopefully they'll come back. And that's what he said he did. So. You know, I, I don't know for sure, but it, it's been said they've over they've doubled your gross since he's, you know, the last seven, eight years. That's exactly right. I, I do touch on a couple of, of operational items here that would that would help in customer service and consistency. We have a lot of resources internally for menus and menu designs and Okay, so I've I've got a tough final question here for you. I think it's final. Um John would probably be much better positioned to answer, but um, in that John came from Troon, why should we go with Brown rather than Troon? What, what's Brown offer us that Troon doesn't? I think the uh, managing the facility as if we owned it is uh, very important. I, I think that when we when we review this and make the comparisons. There's a drastic difference in performance, and uh, I feel very confident that the customer service and the product that Eagle Ridge puts out is very comparable. Um, there is a difference in the way we manage from the other companies that are uh, proposing, and that is, and that is, we think as owners and um, make decisions accordingly. So. Um, and we would like the business. We're we're a small we're a small company. Uh, I consider myself an extraordinarily hard hard worker, and um, you know this is this is on me. It's on Bryce. It's on our corporate team. We're 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 in it. We want to succeed, and we want to grow. And this would be a great opportunity for us. So um, I, I'm I'm confident in in our abilities, but. Uh, <coughs> I would, I, that that's we think differently than than managed facilities. We uh, than the management companies. So. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yeah. yeah thank thank you. you very much. Thanks for all very, the questions. Very informative. Okay, and good luck. <laughs> yeah. Minutes. Okay. We're going to take a break and reconvene at two o'clock or three o'clock. I mean. <laughs> Okay, we're back together and we're going to turn the meeting over to Troon Golf to tell us about what they can do for us. Uh, good afternoon, Neil. And uh, I was getting worried as my sidekick went straight to the bar, so you must have intimidated him. Uh, so uh, my name is Ricardo Caterino with Troon. Um, I'm vice president uh, with them. I've been with the company for about four years. And Zach Vervac, uh, director of operations. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Zach, before we get started. Yep. yep. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Zach Vervac uh, with, with True and Golf, Director of Operations. I uh, came over a couple of years ago from uh, one of the entities that uh, True purchased, uh, Green Golf Partners, a small company based in the Midwest. Uh, I've been there, like I said, for about two years. I would classify myself as uh, the utility player. Um, a lot of different elements of an operation come my way from uh, budget process to agronomy, equipment purchase, food and beverage, um, you name it, quite a, diff quite a few different things uh, come my way. So, like I said, the utility player that I am. Yeah, good job on the water. And I thought you got to dodge. Thanks, uh, Zach. So I'll apologize to all of you. I'm, my back is going to be mainly to you, but I look forward to your questions at the end. Uh, so let's get started. So uh, the goal for today is to introduce you a little bit to Troon, share with you our approach and our process, uh, kind of how we like to do things in general, uh, learn a little, a little bit more about you and Sun and Lake, and also essentially what we perceive are the benefits of a relationship between you and, and Troon. Uh, and then talk you know, through next steps or what those potential next steps could be and answer any questions. More of an informative session. Obviously, you got our submittal, uh, and our goal is to you know, make this interactive. If you, I've seen this done several 
several ways. A lot of groups like to like us to go through the whole presentation and then ask uh, questions at the end. Some might want to have some clarification uh, clarification uh, across the the presentation. Whatever makes you happy, we're flexible. Okay. And if we can't answer the question, I'll pitch it to Zach. Uh, <laughs> so Trune um, again, Trune Golf. So we were we started about uh, 30 years ago in 1990. We're actually celebrating our 30th year now. Uh, the company was founded in Arizona by Dana Garmany. Uh, and uh, on the really the, the, the first uh, property that we managed there was True North, uh, which is you know a staple in daily fee golf and has been around for, for many years. So fast forward 30 years, we have 470 golf courses uh, around the world, 33 countries, 45 states, um, and we have about 440 local uh, locations throughout the world. Um, we also have almost 500 restaurants or food and beverage locations, believe it or not. We have, I got an interesting stat, that we have a larger volume of food and beverage sales than Cinnabon. For those of you that like to visit your local mall, um, don't know what that does for us in particular, but I thought it was an odd fact that I'll share with you today. Uh, <laughs> but it's impressive. And when I started with the company uh, four years ago, we had 270 golf courses. So we've been blessed to have a lot of organic uh, growth as well as some acquisitions. Uh, within those locations, we have about 150 private and semi-private clubs that we manage. Uh, I would venture to say about half of those are member-owned, or, or in another, the other half are owned by a single owner or developer. So, uh, and 80 top 100 golf courses uh, scattered around the, uh, the world as well, mostly uh, within the United States. We also have uh, a good amount of war, uh, experience working with government and public and uh, public agency uh, clients. Um, you see them up there. There's a, a uh, sampling of, of the places we're affiliated with. Um, you know, Papago, which is a, a mainstay. There was a uh, there was a recent article uh, regarding the, the money games and the level of play at Papago. That was on Golf Digest uh, in this last issue. Um, and then Thinkbine, uh, home to the Iowa Hawkeyes and part of the university. And then so, that is. So can I stop you real real quick, sure. Ricardo? I noticed on one of the carts out there uh, there was a Wisconsin Badger. Cart out there? Anybody? Does that belong to? Um, so I'm I'm from Iowa originally, so I'm a huge Hawkeye fan. I was just gonna. Good luck tomorrow. You know, right? <laughs> good game. Should be a good game, hopefully. So, okay, we're trying to get a deal here, Zach. So <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to to upset the crowd. So one vote against us. Thanks, man. Good job. Mm -hmm. um, but so, a National Links Trust is a great story in that we uh, we just uh, got retained with them. There's. Uh, a project is a 50-year lease with the National Parks District to reinvigorate golf in, in D.C. There's three locations. We are fortunate enough to be engaged with them uh, on a 20-year engagement over there to reimagine the the whole uh, the whole golf and its uh, different locations. East Potomac being probably the, the one that's better known, and I know Zach has been working on that project as well. So we've been really fortunate to work with a, a lot of different uh, uh, types of government public agency clients. Uh, you know, Whirlwind, Yochadechi. Uh, Southern Dunes, they're all Native American uh, uh, owned properties uh, and so there's a, a good smattering of, of properties that we can, and clients we've been able to work with. Um, so one of the things we did, as you can see, we put out the map of Florida. One of the things that we did about five years ago, we recognized, because everybody says, oh, true, and you, know, you got this big, right? I just told you all these locations, you know, so what's going to happen? You're going to have all these people flying back and forth from Arizona. No, we, we decided that as a company, it was just really not practical to service all these locations from Arizona. So we opened 11 uh, offices. Uh, Zach and I are both uh, based out of our Palm Beach Gardens office. It took me two hours and... 15 minutes to get here today because I drove slowly. Uh, Zach uh, probably got here in about the same amount of time and you see the star. And those are the locations we have within Florida, uh, all the Trun properties. I know that uh, uh, Mike was just telling me he was down at Colonial uh, yesterday uh, somewhere in the Fort Myers area right there. So uh, I have the uh, good fortune of having you know a terrible territory. So I go uh, typically from this area here to that area there and then the Caribbean. Uh, so it's really tough, but I try and soldier through that one. 
Now we're fortunate, so we get to focus and be really centralized to be able to, to you know, deploy. We just did our recent transaction at uh, outside of Fort Lauderdale at Parkland Golf and Country Club, and that whole transition during COVID was done out of that office. We have 10 people there, and we didn't have to really get anybody in from, from Arizona. We had support remotely as far as information or technology, but, you know, our technology uh, person, Nicole, that's in our office, Zach, myself, food and beverage, operations, agronomy, everything was able to do that. You know, if we didn't have that office, it would be kind of tough to do that. That was actually the first time we did uh, the employee onboard onboarding remotely, Ricardo. And it uh, surprisingly went really well, uh, trying to um, onboard associates. Uh, I think we had 50 or so employees there that uh, we needed to onboard remotely. We didn't exactly know how uh, that process was going to go, but... Uh, um, the ability to have corporate support remotely and then also localized support uh, from us in our office was uh, extremely beneficial. So, yeah, Good point. Thanks, Zach. So um, how do we do things at Troon? We, we, so I joined four years ago after spending a lifetime somewhere else. Um, always had been a big fan of the company, and I, I really was looking for uh, a culture that was hospitality-driven uh, and, and that we had a culture of resources in, in developing uh, that part of the, of the business. And I, you know, at least for me, the experience at Troon, and pretty much everybody I talk to reflects that. That's what we see. We work as a team. Uh, I don't have to be the chief agronomist, the chief food and beverage guy. Neither does Zach. So if Zach has a question, if he needs some help, he can definitely uh, uh, rely on the team because we believe that's why we have subject uh, matter experts and we feel we have a network of support that uh, is second to none. There's 275 corporate uh, support staff uh, amongst our offices. So uh, should we be fortunate enough to work with the Sun and Lake, it'll be the office of Palm Beach would be the main uh, support office, but we have Arizona and also our Birmingham, Alabama office would be able to deploy. Um, we try and focus on a personalized experience, hospitality driven, but you know we also like to focus on data and metrics and benchmarking because at the end of the day it's going to be, you know, that's all fine and dandy, give me a great experience, but there is a budget, I mean, I, at least Neil, um, right, there is still a budget, okay. So that's important, but uh, I like to say we start with the end in mind, and the end is really your end as much as, as ours. We have to deliver to your end from a standpoint, you representing the community and the stakeholders tell us, okay, here's the kind of product we want to have. And then our job is to tell you, here's what we believe it takes to get there. Uh, and it's a very collaborative effort. You know, we don't come in and dictate, okay, this is how we do it. This is the only way to do it. And now we have to understand what are your goals, what vision do you have for the property, and we'll help you through that process. And then we develop a plan, uh, and then we, you know, make sure we have our marching order, so to speak. We collaborate with Tanya and, and her team, make sure that, you know, she's providing her support and, and and her feedback and go from there. Uh, and then we have a plan and we go out about executing it. Um, and then the other thing we're very big is uh, associate training and our you know, quality standards. We have a, a department, uh, I'm, as far as I know, I'm um, not sure if any other uh, uh, company, how they do it. I know we have a learning and development department that we deploy. Then they'll come on staff, uh, they'll come on property. They'll, uh, we're, we believe in strengths-based uh, leadership training and hospitality training. And so they'll interface with the general manager, get a curriculum together, come out, and after the... Uh, uh, the training is done uh, initially in the onboarding. We schedule those sessions to, you know, also develop the staff so they feel there's a career, not just a job. It's how Dana likes to frame it. I know Zach. Anything else you want to add? Good. I must, must have done well then. Um, we talked about resources. Uh, again, uh, these are just, um, it's probably a little bit hard to see in the back, but uh, that's just some of the areas that are supported through our uh, subject matter experts from club operations to procurement, design and development, which could be, you know, renovation of a golf course or a clubhouse. We have uh, in-house experts that would help with that, and they're dedicated to that. There's, I think Cindy Anderson on the club side is doing 60 projects this year, anywhere from, you know, changing carpets to full-on renovations. Uh, I got probably three openings of renovations ranging from 7 to $10 million this year for clubs. Um, and then there's clubs that are doing half a million dollars refreshes on the clubhouses, so we can help with that. Uh, risk management, agronomy, legal, uh, finance and accounting. Um, and uh, we recently, in 2018, acquired Cliff Drysdale Tennis. 
I know that this is more about golf and food and beverage, but they've been really uh, an awesome addition. I enjoy working with those guys because uh, they brought that tennis expertise as well. So if down the road there's there's a, a, a desire to have some input and some uh, support there, they're, they're a great group. And obviously food and beverage, we acquired uh, Real Food, which is a hospitality, a food and beverage hospitality strategy and uh, design company based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, they do some work for Google. They do work for you know private clubs, and uh, they've also been a really good addition because we now can also control that design piece when needed and get get some uh, good visualization for our clients uh, as we decide on projects. So how does it all kind of come together, right? So from an org chart standpoint, you know, you have the board of supervisors, right? And then general manager, uh, which would be Tanya. And then you have the golf and food and beverage GM that oversees the amenities uh, um, from our standpoint and all the department heads. So that's your usual structure. So for us, as I mentioned before, we have our subject matter experts. So each one of these would have access to somebody that can help them. If uh, uh, accounting and finance is centralized. We do it both. Sometimes there's somebody on site that has support. Sometimes we do it out of our main office and facilitate that. Depends on what makes the most sense for the property. Um, but as you can see, human resources, procurement. I don't know, Zach, if you want anything on this one. You know, I just have, you know, questions how it, how it currently exists. Um, you know, when you talk about accounting and finance, is there a, a localized individual on property that, that handles all the accounting? Or does that run up through? For the district, yes. For Indigo, is that of Virginia? Yeah. So we we could we could uh, mirror that. Yeah, okay. and so that would be. Which is curious. That would be under our shared accounting setup, so we could do the same thing. Or, you know, some properties want to have somebody on site, we can do that as well and support it. So. Another uh, unique thing, there's about 100, it's probably closer to 200 golf courses around the world that you know your members here would be able to uh, get access on the daily fee side from Kapalua to True North, I mean locally in state, Tiburon is a big one, uh, and they get the best available rates, so that's part of our uh, True Advantage program, so that will be extended to everybody here, it's people typically are you know happy. We always see a surge when there's a new property, Tiburon calls me and says, hey, I had 255 requests, uh, they got the QBE shootout this week actually just saw him on TV a good team so a point of note uh, the regional agronomist for our office Jeff Cathy uh, was at Colonial Mike for about the open Colonial and he was at Tiburon for the last three years four years so he's actually helping it's the first year that the events are going on without him since we took over but he would be the main point of, uh, of contact for Sun and Lake as well so uh, from a governance standpoint, I know one of the questions is, you know, how does this work? And, and so uh, the board retains full control. We're, our job is, again, a third-party management company. We're the largest in that, and, and that's what we do. We manage on behalf of the board that, you know, provides direction on behalf of the stakeholders or the residents. That's how we see it. Our goal is to provide the expertise, the recommendations, the suggestions, uh, but it's not to make unilateral decisions. Um, and that, you know, we see the board as, as setting the policy and the strategic direction. Tanya and her expertise, because she oversees the, the overall district, uh, we would welcome that input because it's an integrated solution in our view. And we got to make sure that, you know, how do we maximize and leverage the synergies between the residents and, and the amenities. Uh, and then the club on-site membership will prepare the annual budget and the annual business plan, and that is playing into a strategic plan that's created. But that's generally how we see our process. And you got to hear me see process a lot just because that's kind of how we do it. Uh, another question for, for the group. I'm not sure who it's addressed to. Is there a subsidiary committee and or board that directly oversees just the golf course portion, like a golf advisory committee? We have, we have a golf committee that works in an advisory capacity. They don't have any authority. Okay. Good. Do they report back to... The board. We have um, we have a board yes member no. who sits yeah. on the committee, and, he, and any any recommendations come back to the board. Okay. okay. Good. So Just trying to understand the, the the flow of communication between you know the management company, 
the golf course, <laughs> and then if there are any other subcommittees, and then upwards uh, to the board. Worked with a, a lot of different uh, types of committees and, and boards and how that process works. So it's imperative. That's a good question. Do, do they interface just with a board member or also with a club manager, typically? They, if, if it's a key recommendation or thought that they would like to have, then they would work with the general manager. But um, generally, the the committee doesn't report to the board. The committee would report to the general manager who would bring things to the board. Perfect. So um, we noticed also, uh, I touched upon this before, transparency. Um, most of our engagements, and for those of you that uh, visited some of our properties, will see this on the, you know, either, either if it's a master HOA uh, or if it's a district, if it's a, a, a municipal or governmental agency, there's always obviously the issue of transparency in public versus private entities, etc. Um, I'll, you know, give you an example. Uh, one of the clubs I'm involved with, Colonial Country Club, being an HOA, they're obviously subject to uh, Florida Statute 720, uh, which basically, you know, dictates between legal and HR matters, those are typically under executive session. So when we, we look at those, but we believe in transparency. I mean, typically the executive team and part of that, that budgetary process, they're tied to a bonus structure and they're tied to you know certain metrics we want to incentivize and those we believe have to be shared with the board so we can put those in the budget uh, because you have to have information to make you know good, sound decisions. Uh, when, you know, So our main messaging here is we're open to figure out what's the best process that's obviously a legal one and also creates a good environment for the associates but you know it's pretty full disclosure you know to whatever degree we can I mean we don't have an incentive in doing that we want to although stress that you want to make sure you get the best possible human asset human capital you can get I mean obviously it's like anything else right you're going to go out and recruit a wide receiver it could be you know a first round pick or a third round pick but you want to make sure that at the same time you get what is needed for here and that it's a good balance uh, choice for for the property, and you have visibility into that. So I don't know if that uh, addresses uh, the issues there. We were going to add a slide in here that ha that showed, you know, some comparable salary prices, you know, price ranges, and and we decided not to include, you know, include that. We didn't want to finger, you know, finger point somebody somebody down on a on a salary point uh, based upon how long they had been here. We try to work with within the existing staff members to, you know, meet budgetary either restraints or or net income on a yearly basis. So uh, we we did. I have it. If yeah, I think you know, more than the, the board is wanting. Can we have it? Did Greg send it over? No, I think okay. you might have the pro forma. Uh, but I, I think the main point of this slide is a collaborative partnership. We met somebody outside uh, one of the attendees and said, hey, we have the best chef in Central Florida. Now, do I know if it's the best chef or not? I don't know because I've never even tried the food. But my point is we look at these decisions and, hey, here's our assessment. Here's what we think. And uh, we feel that you are able to then have the information that you need to make that decision. Uh, but it's not solely based on price. We like to, if anything, focus on value. What is the value that you want to deliver for your constituency? Um, so, from a first impression standpoint, I'm going to turn it over to Zach. And Zach, you know, was here with Greg, and they they were able to have a, a good understanding through the tour. So, Zach, you know, why don't you tell the uh, the group uh, your your thoughts in general? My take, um, you know, we were only here on property for about an hour, so it's hard to I'm going to say be extremely critical of the operation um, you know looking at the golf course when we drove around I thought it was extremely clean um, I know the golf course superintendent here uh, Earl McMahon I worked with him uh, in my previous days uh, in in the Tampa area Tampa market he's helped our company out before he's a quality individual uh, I also know the budgetary restraints that he's up against but you know from a, a weed suppression playability um, you know the greens looked really good, um, and the only item I would say is I couldn't tell you if if I was on the fifth hole or the seventh hole or the twelfth hole. Um, it, it seemed like a lot of Florida golf. I grew up in the Midwest, you know, where there's a lot of undulation. So in Florida, how do you separate yourself 
from your nearest competitor down the road. And it wasn't a knock on the golf course. Please don't take it as a as a negative. I just didn't. Nothing you know really stood out other than than 18, which I believe we toured the tour turtle course that day. I believe 18 is a par three. Deer, signature hole. So I, rem- I remember that one vividly. A lot of water. I thought from 235 yards out into the fan, am I going to hit hybrid or, or three wood? I hope nobody has to get back that far too often. Um, driving into the property, I was pleasantly surprised with with the amenities, um, how clean the parking lot looked, uh, the newer renovations that you've recently done. I, I thought. It were done really well. We took a tour of the kitchen. I thought the setup was was done fairly well. Um, you know, only critical item I, I would say I wouldn't even call it critical uh, would be uh, on the website. You know, there are some stock imagery that it, that has been done on the on the website. I would, you know, within the first probably 90 to 120 days, try to get some some new photography updated. Um, I thought ease of access to uh, get a get a tea time was was uh, fairly easy. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to hop on the member portal to see, you know, what that interaction was like, whether or not you could pay your bill. I'm not sure if you have member privileges, member charges um, um, here or not. But you know, those were were first impressions. Um, so first 90 days. Rock and roll. What did you mean by it didn't have the wow factor? It um, is is exactly that. I, it's it was good, but how you know one hole being memorable as compared to character, right? I think that what we try and do within reason, right, because we, we have to be cognizant of the budget, but if there's anything we can do to move, for instance, mowing patterns, can we change the mowing patterns on certain of the fairways and create some better definition, get it to roll? Can we make sure that, you know, they can look at some of the landscape areas and enhance those? But obviously all that would have to be a plan that we engage our superintendent because just to come in and say, oh, we got all these great mowing patterns, all this great landscape, because, well, I can't service that. So it's got to be a measured approach. But uh, I, well, the feedback I heard was just say, you know, it kind of tended to blend a little bit together. Saw 18 holes on a quick tour. Maybe it's an unfair characterization, but it's all about if you play this in, day in and day, day out in any course, really, the superintendents are always kind of tinkering. How do we make this hole stand out? You know, although I remember one superintendent I used to work uh, with in Denver that we played a little money game and he hid it in a bunker. And next time I came in town, he filled in the bunker, but that's a whole different. That's not the tinkering I'm referring to. But the idea is to have a situation where you can go out there and say, huh, I saw something different. Oh, I remember this hole. Look at how this looks. And somebody, if somebody comes in and, and plays the golf course, they say, oh, that was really nice. I remember more than one hole. So in the first 90 days, uh, should we be fortunate enough to, to, to be engaged? We put together this schedule. It's a very high, high level. Um, and maybe you can quickly kind of run, run us through this, uh, Zach. Sure. Um, so after, you know, the agreement is finalized, um, obviously we need to collect a lot of critical data, um, evaluate key staff members and positions, uh, and then internally we have um, a transition team that helps with the onboarding process of new employees. Um, we, we would come on site and, and uh, all employees would become true employees, go through that process. Uh, we send out a questionnaire to the associates uh, as well as to the, the membership and then also to the board. Uh, to garner feedback on operational items such as golf events to social events, food and beverage, golf course conditions, um, what other amenities would you like to have included. Uh, That's usually done within the first 30 to 60 days, uh, pending other critical items that need to be to be addressed. Um, You know, the, the key portion is Getting all the associates together and getting them onboarded, and you know, understanding of what our expectations are that we've worked through and with the board and with Tanya to say, 
this is what you can expect moving forward. Um, that's a yeah. very key element in the process. Without associate and, and employee buy-in, anything that we talk about is a mood point. You know, if they don't like me or they don't like Ricardo, it's tough for that individual to listen to, to what we have to say. And, uh, you know. Yeah, and create a little bit also of a culture match. I mean, understanding how we go about things. Or, I mean, I touched upon the culture of having a career versus having a job and letting them know that they can develop and continue to grow. So we'll then, you know, after commencement, uh, we have a transition team. We just recently re uh, restructured our account accounting uh, department to have a director of transitions on the accounting side. And when I say recent, it was announced to me yesterday uh, because we have a director of transitions, which is an individual that all that individual does is keep track of all the items that go into a transition for a new property. So that individual also prepares a 30, 60, 90 day review that comes to you and here's an update of all the items and it's typically surprising all the stuff that is accomplished in the first 90 days. And then there's an owner meeting that kind of discusses those items. Start again, goes back to that strategic plan: where you want to go, what are the hot buttons, what are the strategies you want to work on, uh, etc. So there's also a communications piece that goes out to the to not only to the the, the public and the w big wide world, but also there's a, a usually a member town hall meeting and we we'll field field questions and everybody will say, "I hate the food, I love the food." Favorite is, "I hate the food, but I love the chef." We get that quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> We know the chef is popular. Uh, but so then, you know, surveys to Zach's point, uh, we collect these. These are mostly our, what do we call our, our benchmarking surveys because we want to know where we start. And so then we know how to measure progress going forward. Okay, my question? Good. I have some, but I'll wait. All right. So, so Zach, what about replacement of equipment? Okay. I was going to mention one other thing. After that 30-day checkpoint, the, the board would receive a report that basically outlines, uh, uh, I just went through one as a reference point uh, a couple of days ago, and it was surprising how long uh, that document was of actionable items that need to be addressed, whether or not they, you know, we checked that box. Um, and every 30, 60, and 90 days, you'd receive a you know, essentially an operational update of, of the status of all these items okay. that need to be addressed. So what we tried to do in, the, in our presentation is address the eight questions that were, were presented to the uh, four companies. Number six was replacement of, a, of equipment, uh, which I have um, just recently finished and got it across the finish line for uh, six of our leased properties in, in our portfolio. And I'll say there's, there's two approaches, okay? We can, we can lease high heavy wear equipment or you can purchase your equipment and or purchase um, longevity items such as airifiers, tractors, um, you know, CNC machinery, stuff like that within your shop that has a shelf life of, I'm going to say, over five years. Um, the, the biggest aspect in, in looking at our portfolio, because we were about to purchase roughly $600,000 worth of equipment, was, okay, how many holes do I need to plug, right? And how much money do I have to spend? And... In, in going through this process, you realize, I wish I had more money to spend, right? You always, you know, every superintendent is never going to say, no, I won't take that brand new piece of equipment, or no, I don't need that, right? They always, they always, and you want them to be coming to you um, in that fashion to keep the operation moving along. But our, our thought process is to... Um, take the higher hour used pieces of equipment, greens mowers, T mowers, fairway units, rough units, and you want to lease those pieces of equipment over three or four years and then potentially have the option to purchase those pieces of equipment after three or four years. And uh, the reason for that, uh, what we found out in 2020 we were going to purchase some equipment within our portfolio. COVID hit, and it was like, hey, 
Let's, let's hold off on spending some money. And we're like, okay, we get it. We understand. So we looked at our equipment maintenance through 11 months. And between those six golf courses, we were roughly 30% higher on our equipment repair budget collectively, which amounted to, I'm going to say, 35000 over budget. And that's just six golf courses. So you start looking at that dollar amount on what you're, what you're spending to keep dated or older equipment running and um, you know you start looking at that dollar amount and you're like we should have just probably bit the bullet and bought the equipment right away right um, another I'm gonna I'm gonna from the procurement side of things yeah uh, I was just gonna add I think the other part that's important is we are fortunate we have a really good relationship with on the on the equipment side with John Deere and Toro our main relationship being with Toro um, and that allows us to leverage that relationship not only for procurement savings uh, mechanic schools you know if we have an issue with, uh, on the warranty basis we can go to them as well and that helps uh, you know if there's a need here we can get that done as well uh, and we've found that in general because of, of the size of our relationship, we're able to, to get them to the forefront and react a little bit quicker and get things done. At the end of the day, it all depends on you know how often you're going to use this. Also, and, the, and your equipment manager slash mechanic is critical, right? Do we have the right PM, you know, preventative maintenance programs uh, in place that's going to extend the life of your equipment as well? So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you can go to that one. That's fine. Um, one, I had a question. Is there currently a capital reserve program in place for the golf course? Do you set aside 1%, 3%, 5% for capital improvements? We don't have a set percentage now. Okay. I, w I was just curious mm -hmm. because that's also through this process from a corporate level, I wanted to be able to go back to my general managers and say, this is how much capital you have to spend every year. And then this is what I want the bottom line to represent. It's tangible, right? You know, granted, every superintendent would love to, to get brand new greens mowers every three years, but how does that affect the bottom line? And that's imperative in, in running a golf course. The, the other item, uh, you know, we were, we were lucky enough at one of our properties, uh, we had one of our spraying units go down and needed one right away so we looked at purchasing uh, a used Toro 1750 that purchase price is a four-year-old unit with a thousand hours and I think purchase price was twenty or twenty two thousand dollars so we went to Toro corporate said what's a brand new unit cost well retails forty eight thousand okay what's the price said thirty thousand plus tax we went, hmm, 22000 for a four-year-old unit, 32000 all in with, with tax, and, tax and finance fees. We decided to purchase the brand new piece of equipment. So that's tangible. I tell you that because it's, it's real. It's recent to me in my mind. So that's why I wanted to share that with the, the equipment. I mean, the, the other thing we'll do is obviously coming in, we'll take a list of all equipment, we'll take an assessment, figure out what the estimated life is, get the, get the schedules put together. And again, he goes back to, you see at the bottom, it says collaborative process, collaborative process, like sharing. We're not going to come back to the, the, I mean, there's a difference between managing, right, and like the reporting daily, that's not the role, but also is there's a, the reason where usually there's a monthly meeting or a prep meeting where you get the information okay, this is why, what we recommend, and here's the data, and here's why. Um, I know the other question was on the F&B. Uh, start, go back. Excuse me, before you go to number seven, go back to six. Yep. And give me your opinion on golf carts. Golf carts? In what regard? Same purchase or? Yeah, I mean, would you recommend leasing, buying outright? I mean, there's options out there. What you can mm -hmm. There are. Um, I think probably 90 to 95 percent of the golf industry leases um, with the addition of lithium batteries now um, in, in talking to club car one of my good friends who I've known for 20 years George Henry is a club car rep in the Tampa market they are the lithium batteries are going to last longer than the life of, of the body so now they're trying to figure out ways to, okay, how do we refurbish 
the fleet and 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 keep the existing battery going. Uh, previous flooded lead acid batteries are are rated for 25,000 amp hours, which if you do 35,000 rounds a year and have, let's say, 80 carts in your fleet, you're going to burn out in about two and a half years. And then all of a sudden you're like, what do I do? Do I turn in the fleet early and roll some negative equity? Or do I replace the existing flooded lead acid batteries? The new lithium are, are rated for 55,000 amp hours. So all of a sudden, a three or four year cart lease, typically it's, it's four years, uh, we just financed one at five and a half years, just from an amp hour usage, knowing that we might need to turn around and refurbish the actual bodies yeah. and or pieces on there. So and again, we'll be interested over the next few years to see how, it, how that plays out. And again, it's all got to depend on the cash flow of the particular property, right, and the needs. You might say, hey, I, I'll live with a lease on this particular fleet because I want to address these needs that have not been addressed or, or not. You might say, hey, we're seeing, it's a great question because we're seeing all, all kinds of, of different iterations. We have uh, properties uh, like St. James Plantation's got hundreds of carts, uh, and we we decided to take a look at it and say, does it make sense to replace them all at the same time? That's like the, the usual thought process is bring them all in, bring them all out, typically because of the body and, and the wear and tear. Well, we actually went into a, a rotation of, bot, of, of uh, replenishing the carts so we don't have the outlay. I mean, all of a sudden, that, I think, let's say, our average uh, cost, let's say it's four to $5,000 a cart, and you start kind of bringing those in, you have 200 carts, and we're talking some real dollars there. So uh, all of that will be considered. So and then the recommendation it, is made. It also comes down to how do you how do you realize that that spend right? Is it is it a operating capital uh, or is it you know below the line? You know that's a key element in, in looking at financials. So so we talked about the lease versus buy um, F and B assessment. Zach, I know you uh, spent some time out these there as more, well. These are more questions. You know, for the for the board, you know, is the food and beverage operation a profit center or an amenity? You know, what areas of that operation do you enjoy, and and what areas would you like to see improved? Yeah, and I, mm -hmm. well, I think this I is we were supposed to ask you that. right, right. Well, <laughs> well but we before can, you we go, can, Zach, I think it's important. This will also be part of our due diligence process when we come in. We've got to strategize with you and say, okay, what what is it that you want it to be? Right? Somebody might say thirty dollars for a lunch for two. You know, it's the greatest deal I've ever had. Somebody might say thirty dollars is, you know. Out of the out of this world, I think that was actually a specific comment that we got. But it depends. It goes back to the value and the strategic direction that you want to have uh, uh, on there. So the question is: some some clubs see it as an amenity and are willing to subsidize it. Some of them say, "I want it to break even, but I want to get the most value out of it as I can." And some of them say, "Say I want it to be a profit center and get as many people in here as you can," and knowing that each one of those has a a trade off. Right? Go ahead, Zach. If, and if you are wanting it to be profitable and this is the dollar amount that's brought in, we can make it profitable. But you may not like that experience. You may not like that product. I mean, with having over 500 F&B outlets, we have a wide range of, you know, from $100,000 in, in food and beverage to... 15, 16, 17, 18 million dollar food and beverage operations that lose money. You know, so it, it depends. That's why it's 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 so important to have that that question up there is because we need to manage it to your expectations, to the community's expectations. Well, I wish I could if if I could give you that answer now. You're bidding for the business, right? Mm -hmm. You want sure. us to tell you everything. No, nope. nah, I don't think you want to tell everything, no, but I do they think want you have us to collaborate. And yeah, I, I would think. say that in the in the years I've been on the board, our our stated goal would be to at least get it to a break even. You know, it it it's been operating more as an amenity that's losing money, and we'd like to get to the point where we're at least breaking even with it. Good, thank you, Ray. To, to elaborate with these questions that that are asked, it. it that's why it's it's imperative to mention the, the collaborative effort. We can come in and, and give recommendations, 
Um, we could come in and tell you this is exactly how we're going to do it, but the important thing is we're, we're trying to do it collectively, you know, together. How do you want to see this operation succeed and or run? What do you want to offer, right? Menu offerings to well, social events, to, to price points. It goes to back. You want to try and get the five of us to decide on what we want on, on this information today? No, not at all. I think that this is illustrative of the... So one of the points that was made to us is transparency and collaboration, right? How, uh, the, the point for us is we'll go through our process, and this is not for you to answer now. This is the kind of questions we'll come back and say, give us what you want to see, because each one of these decisions are going to lead to an experience point on the end. So when your golfers come out of the golf course, the, the beer costs 50 cents or $5, or whatever that in-between is, is going to dictate... You know the level of profitability, your cost of sales on that on that operation, and then it's going to also dictate the level of satisfaction. And you might say, and I think, and Neil, you you answered, you gave us the direction. I think already that hopefully is kind of unanimous to say hey, we really would like to get to break even. So we'll come in, do the data, look at the benchmarkings, base it off you know the pro forma that that was given, which is to where it is now, and say we can improve it if we do X, Y, and Z. I'll give an example at uh, Colonial that we mentioned earlier. Uh, Colonial went through, uh, it was a Pulte development. We've been there for about 20 years. So in the beginning, 50 odd thousand rounds on 18 holes, uh, and they entertained outside play. They entertained two to 5,000 rounds a year on outside play. About three years ago, the board of directors says, look, we looked at this. We got a tremendous amount of people. People are spending more time here. We really are seeing a detrimental impact on the experience of our members and residents on the golf course. We want to cut off the outside play. Okay, we didn't make that decision because it's not our money. It's your money at the end of the day. What we did is we went back and did the analysis and said, okay, here's what we would take. Here's what be the financial impact. Here are the strategies we put in place. But you as a board would say, and here's the impact that you're going to have to decide if you're willing to make that decision because there was a financial impact at the end of the day. And they said, yeah, you know, we sign up for that. And we went on and we cut off the, the outside rounds. Flip side is they said, hey, you know what? Our members are not too happy. They feel like the beer is too expensive. The happy hours are too expensive. We ran through the numbers, did the analysis, made the recommendation again and said, in our opinion, if you change and do this, I think the level of satisfaction is going to grow. People are going to be happy with the happy hours and the outcome they're going to have. And this is what we did. So we go through those decisions um, because you know it's kind of hard to have transparency and collaboration if one side is typically dictating it, right? Right. So, in your in your pro forma, what assumption did you make on the food and beverage? On the pro forma, we we made the assumption we'd run at a similar level it is running today. That's what we did. We're just telling you we don't just run it how it's running today. You would our our job as as a management coming in would be to analyze what what is there and what opportunities we can bring to make it better. Either by drawing more programming, more re, more uh, participation, increasing the the scope of target demo demographic we can go after, uh, or by driving margin, or by driving satisfaction. But that will be a conversation will we'll not be dictated just by us, essentially. But we assume we'll be operating at the same level it's operating today. Ray? I have nothing to say about Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> I can't believe it, but I have nothing to say. Okay, so okay. Just going through this process. I mean, I'm trying to I apologize if that was rude. No. Nope. Why? Obviously, we're not happy with what's going on. Otherwise, why would we go through this? Okay. Right. Let, let, and so well, let, you let, had all the numbers. Let, let me clarify from what I read in there, pro forma. When he says operating it the way that it is, providing the same level of quality and service, but managing the expenses better so that the bottom line is better. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, the exactly. Line? So it's going to get a better bottom line, but we, we, didn't, we, didn't, uh, we didn't anticipate to, we didn't, for instance, we didn't anticipate to run it as an amenity. That's what I'm saying. We, we tried to go to your concern of the bottom line. I'm sorry if you didn't understand that. That was not that was not the answer. The point is that there's got to be more opportunity out there, Ray. There's got to be more opportunity as it pertains to what kind of program can you do to drive the revenue? What can we do with service? Knowing that the priority is in this case a financial one. We just want to illustrate that these are the kinds of questions we go through on the process uh, as we go through it. We just don't don't come in and dictate to you what the numbers should be. That's the main point of the slide. It's not meant to tell you we're going to go and do it this way. If you say, look, I wanted to break even. 
even, we'll come back to you with a strategy to break even. I didn't mean to infer that you were going to come in and dictate to us. I understand that point. I just was expecting perhaps a little bit more. That okay. you would come in and say, we see a lot of opportunity here. We'd like to sit down and talk to you. Know, this is going to be one of our priorities to take your expenses from and put them to here. Well, yeah. One one thing you have to keep in mind, Ray, is that 2020 is is unprecedented in in the food and beverage industry, right? No one knew in in March or April how the rest of the year was going to roll out. No one still knows what restrictions. I know here within the middle of the state, it's it's a lot more lax than it is in like Palm Beach County as far as when and where you need to to wear masks, how many people you can have indoors. We can't predict the future, so it's it's hard to say, yep, you currently do $600,000 in banquet sales, or you used to in 2019, and then turn around and say, yep, we can drive 100, or, you know, 850000 in, in banquet sales. We don't know what 2021 is going to bring from a restriction standpoint, um, and, and it makes it difficult to answer that question. Not, you know, not to mention, we don't want to come in and tell you we're going to get rid of $2 Tuesdays. All of a sudden, we've got 75 members that are that are ready to, to walk out the door because we got rid of $2 Tuesdays. Uh, I mean, I think the, the reason of that question as well, Ray, is when you look at the way it's worded, is keep in mind that there's a there's an expense standpoint, there's an exceptional service piece of it, there's a quality of menu piece of it, and there's a financial piece of it. And that's why, you know, as you move forward, you can drive that revenue to his point within within reason. And banquet business right now, I mean, we got properties that have banquet business that got pushed with success. We got everybody to push their banquet business three months down the road, and now guess what? It's getting canceled again. Why? Because people didn't account for the Thanksgiving surge. But I think by and large, we feel that that's an operation that... But based on your knowledge, where should my banquet business be compared to my a la carte business? See, these are things I thought you'd come in and tell us. Okay, well... We, stand, we, we can't predict the next nine months or ten months because of the COVID and everything, but th there are statistics that you should be able to provide to us which would help us make a decision. Okay, and we can, if you feel that's a point that was missed, we can gladly send, send you some more information on that if you'd like yeah. us to, to add to that. <coughs> Probably just more. Mm. It's okay, Ray. It's a good question. It is. The only good part of that is that it sounds to me like you're willing to work with the five of us. Yeah. Because right. sometimes it's it's difficult. I think we all five have, have felt the same way for a couple of years, and we can't get a change. Mm -hmm. It's nice to know that somebody might pay attention to what we want. Well, you're the client. That's that's what I, that's my. That's point. at least what they they taught me. <laughs> all right. Um, we talked about Colonial a little bit. Um, Tishi management, um, Zach. That was one of the pieces of information that was that was, I believe, Omar. Did you send that over the the league play, and what our what our thought process was on that? You know, so I did some you know real quick math to realize that you do, you know, 1,050 rounds, league rounds, uh, Monday through Saturday. Uh, so, you know, you start taking a look at a couple of different things, right? What's the makeup of these leagues? Okay, are they? Is is every league president and or person in charge a member? And then, what's what's the makeup of that that group? Right? Is it all members that play along with it, or is it members and their guests, or is it outside league members? Okay, you kind of understand the makeup of the league. And then you go dive in a little bit deeper and you go, okay, what's, what's the rate structure, right? If it's members and member guest, are they paying the full member guest rate? That would be one question I have. And then you take it a step further because you, on, a, on a rate structure level, if Mr. Haverkamp comes in and his group is given the $15 rate and, and it hasn't been raised over the past six years, but Mr. Brown came in and we told him it's seventeen dollars, but guess what? You've got members that play in both leagues, and they go, "Wait a minute, why am I paying fifteen dollars on Tuesday and seventeen dollars on Thursday? Why, why is there a price discrepancy?" So it's imperative that you're 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 equal across the board when it comes to your rate structure. Okay. These and then the, these are all members that we sent to you. Mm -hmm. Member groups. With just members, no outside, no guests. 
no outside at all. I mean, yeah. somebody's, you know, these are a kid in town, they're going to play in the group, yeah. Well, yeah. I, but that's that's an exception. Well, yeah, exception. well then, if we flip back to that previous slide real, sure. real quick. So, and then two other things. I know, I understand they're members. Given preferential treatment, right? That drives the bottom line here. But I, I would ask, okay, what's if if a group is booking 24 participants? What's the average participation rate per week? Is it 24? They get 24 players every week, or is it 20, or is it 16? Okay, because that leads to the next question of when do those groups need to be solidified? before you cancel tea times in that group. Because if it's eight hours, you know, you've got Saturday morning at eight o'clock and Bill decides to call the golf shop at 5.30 on Friday night, you have zero opportunity to drive any incremental revenue at that point for one, two, three groups, right? For whatever reason, if the group of, let me grab a random group, hopefully I grab a good one here. All right, so, the wood couples, right? 12.30 shotgun, 120 players. If, if I'm a head golf professional, right? Sorry, if anybody plays in the wood group, I, I apologize. So if, if that's Saturday at 12.30, there should be a 48 hour in advance cancellation pile policy. That means by Thursday at 12.30, there's either 120 or there's 92 or there's whatever that number is. And if someone else wants to sign up after that, they need to be in constant communication with somebody you know, on the golf shop staff to say, do I still have the opportunity to bring more people, right? Because the golf course isn't full at that point in time. Yeah, it's so. got to be actively managed as well. We try and see. What, we, what we've seen is, if unfortunately, you'd be ready. You're like, that's fine. It should be like, make sense, right? Unfortunately, a lot of times it doesn't because what we see is group organizers and the staff get into this kind of routine, right? And I'm not advocating that that's what's happening here or not. And then you say, I got another, you know, hold on another 12, you know, 20 tee times for me. And the group can not be 80, could be 70, could be 65, depending on the weather. So that all's got to be managed from a tee sheet standpoint. You probably could agree upon a couple of dates for yeah. yeah. So, do you know if that's in place now? I, I guarantee, looking at 1,064 players a week, you're not. You'd be lucky to average 900 a week. And then all of a sudden, you're like, that's 164 tee times a week. You're like, there's 600 tee times out there that I possibly could be selling to the general public that helps subsidize the bottom line. You know, that keeps my membership fees members. down. That keeps $2 Tuesdays going. Hold on. Just so you know, we also have members that don't play in any of these groups but play on the courses. You should do Spark. Pardon? Spark. Spark? Mm -hmm. It's a new league. It's run. Oh. It's completely independent. No, I'm just saying a lot, of the, a lot of women like to go on their own. They'll book tea times and they go and play. Sure. They're members as well, right. not playing in the group. Mm -hmm. That's one of the advantages, right? You live on the golf course. You've got your own golf cart. You're like, I've got time to run out and play three <laughs> holes. Perfect. Call the golf shop. Just let us know where out you're out there. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you know, the, the other part is, um, again, l using data. The, and the key is to see where the soft spots are, what, how is it being utilized. And, and I actually, you know, you'll see a see a heat map kind of like this that's what our team would, would create and take a look at every possible area uh, and say okay here's your strategy so right now you have you know kind of your current strategy is two, two, um, two rates out there and then you know goes back to creating that strategic plan so okay what do I want to see for my constituents and what do I see for people that come from the outside <laughs> should we just have a rate for everybody or should be you know higher differential rates do we want to engage in dynamic pricing or just dynamic pricing for those that come from the outside if you have a week that a lot of people come into town for the races or something else, should we should we drive that uh, to that? So if it's uh, Josh Ward in our office and his team will take a look at this and then map it out and put it out there for uh, along with the team here. I know I, I know that's that. a tough one to see for anybody in the in the group. Does anybody fly? Right, you book air book an airplane. You know, yeah. Right? I mean, you don't ever you don't ever hop on an airline and go, I know it's going to be $75, right? 
you have no idea, right? You have no idea what that price point is going to be. I'm going to say the dynamic pricing model is now making its way into, into the golf industry. We're not insinuating that it is something that you should implement, especially when it comes to member rates and or member guest rates. But when it comes to, you know, random individuals coming in to, to play, if they want that 10 o'clock tea time on Saturday morning and your rack rate is $65, <coughs> they might be willing to pay $100 a person. Why shouldn't you capitalize on that? Especially if it's not affecting your members, your members and, get, and guests, and or those particular groups. Mm -hmm. That's what it, it capitalizes on, raising your average daily rate. So yeah, and then going back to the leagues as well. I mean, we, you have 36 holes. Some clubs are also debating and, and having a, a view of it. Should we have the leagues monopolize all the morning tea times? We're seeing a lot of uh, situations where members are like, you know, I can't get a tea time out there. So if we have that issue or not, you're blessed to have two golf courses here. So sometimes there's a, there's got to have a discussion with those groups. Again, it goes about the totality, or are the groups inclusive enough to where those ladies that that uh, Ray mentioned do they? have an equal opportunity to get out on the golf course because if you don't have satisfaction on that front it's going to be hard to retain or at least their loyalty they'll start going somewhere else even if they live here so we talked about that um you know we had some case studies on the revenue management we don't, we're not going to go through all of them um I have to read. This is, it's a small slide. I'll give you one specific example uh, that we've had implemented at one of our Florida properties for one year. Um, that average daily rate has gone from thirty-one dollars and twenty cents to I want to say thirty-four eighty-five. We've been able to maintain the same amount of rounds. So you can see a couple of different things in, in revenue management, and that is one. You raise the average daily rate and reduce your rounds, meaning the amount of wear and tear on the golf course. Or in this specific example, we were able to minimally raise that average daily rate of $3. You know, you take that times 30,000 rounds, you do some quick math, it's 90,000 to the bottom line. So, that, I mean, I'm just trying to give you tangible examples because I know Ray's going to beat me up some more on something over there. <laughs> didn't even hear. <laughs> so I wanted to try to give uh, some, uh, some, uh, some specific you know example. At least you know what's coming. But no, Ray asks some good questions. He does. I, I think the other part of this is what we tend to see is where are the opportunities on the T sheet, and how does that drive bottom line dollars? Can it subsidize something else? Um, and our team, you know, I, I I know we've done a couple of examples recently where same amount of rounds, but we've netted 10 to 15 percent more on ADR. Um, you know, it's just dollars that weren't there before because, you know, generally you post a rate and say, you know, here's what our rate is uh, and, and walk away, which is, I think, what you saw a little bit on the heat map. So how do we see this working for Sun and Lake and our involvement? So I think, uh, uh, Mike, you hit the nail on the head as far as collaborative partner, and I think uh, that was something we really wanted to hammer at home um, <laughs> because we see this as creating this strategy and taking, you know, if it's all financial, Ray, then, you know, it's all financial and this is what it takes to get there, and here's the opportunities we see, and here's the tactics that we see. How do we going to leverage? Is it the wedding business? Is it the, uh, you know, local uh, banquet business on, on the other side, or is it going to the 3,000 rooftops you have here and figuring out, okay, how many are actually going to Island View? Are we actually reaching out to them? Are we putting out a product that makes sense? Do we have the reputation that makes sense? I was involved with a property many years ago out of a double wide trailer, and they won best uh, restaurant in the county four years in a row. It had nothing to do with location. It looked nice enough, but there's the food and the people and the service. Uh, but that being said, we stopped by your clubhouse on the way in. You know, We met Ron, your F&B uh, uh, director is a very nice guy, at least at first blush, that people said. So is there a question of, you know, if we are fortunate enough to be engaged, 
evaluating that, how can we redirect that, but can, are we doing enough to find the business? Because right now a lot of it is local business. People are not, they want to be where, where they feel safe. How do we communicate the protocols? Not just saying, hey, we're safe, come and see us. Is there a strategy to put it out there and say, hey, here's how we make sure that we COVID compliant. Here's some of the videos. Here's what we do. Here's what our team is doing to make sure that's safe. Uh, because the banquet business will take some time to come, to come back. Uh, and then is incremental spending. How do we get more of the wallet share of, of each one of those individuals? But also, you don't want to have your residents feel like they're being nickel and dime. There's got to be value in that proposition on both sides. Um, so the other part of that is the experience. Uh, so hopefully what it'll do is it'll drive uh, some value. And then it's sustainable. Sustainable and, and you know, if we weren't clear before, we're clear now, right? That it's, uh, you know, viability is, is an important one. But I feel that with our resources from a standpoint of the food and beverage support and looking at the structure and looking at what's out there, uh, I mean, you saw the number of disciplines that are out there available to come in and take a look from top down, uh, but not just make, you know, arbitrary cuts, because then what happens is people say, yeah, that's great. We, we, I mean, I'll tell you as a group, and you probably already know this, is I had a conversation with this with the president of one of my clubs. It's like I, I, I'm glad I, I bumped into the FMB, uh, the director of FMB, because we had a conversation that led to a discussion on, on the menu pricing. Can you believe they're going to raise the price of the beer by 50 cents? Man, they'll have my head. And I said, well, you understand the cost of sales is going to go up. He goes, no, 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 no. This is not the time to raise the beer 50 cents. I said, okay, Terry, I understand. But we believe in being straightforward and open because there's multiple considerations. I think if you typically have good, uh, happy people, they'll frequent the place more. If we have the right kind of programming and we leverage like we've done across our clubs, uh, they'll come m instead of once, twice, and three times. But you've got to also make sure you're giving them a reason more so than here's a hot dog or a burger. And so the financial results then, we believe we can deliver those as well. So that's kind of how we see the relationship. Um, and now uh, we'll open it up for questions. I have a real Sure. Uh, when I talked to, uh, I think it was Rick down at Colonial, I, and you guys are going through there uh, quite a <laughs> renovation. Yeah, that's. Uh... And I asked him though, because uh, I I didn't want I didn't I just wanted their opinion and. And I asked this uh, the other group earlier that uh, one of my concerns are the employees that we have, and I would like them to be considered uh, if we do switch to you. And uh, because so many, this is a smaller community, and, and for some reason, some people think that everybody should stay just because they're friends. But yeah. I, I'm concerned about if if they're capable, I would like to see him. <laughs> I don't know how you do it, because I ask, uh, is it Jim down there? Jim, yeah. Jim. Mm -hmm. I asked Jim how they were, and he said, we usually try to keep everybody that we can. And I'm again, I, I don't think yeah. we should tell you who to keep, but I would like for you to keep it in your mind that yeah. to make me happy, I would like you to, no, I mean, to uh, give them question. an opportunity to stay if they want. I mean, we, we might have some that want to stay with the company they're with now. That's, so. that's a, a fair question, and um, it's like I, I feel like saying, read my lips, right? But uh, the, the reality is, um, you know, we, we, we don't have the big Troon bus full of Troon people that are going to kind of show up and, and, uh, the first day, and we got to turn over all the staff. I mean, we've, we're about 20,000 associates worldwide, and a lot of the, the you know, great associates that have joined our company came through either an acquisition or a transition or organic growth. I mean, we've been fortunate. Last five years, we have a 93% renewal rate on our contracts, and um, we've signed more contracts combined uh, than our top uh, five competitors together per year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't possibly do that. By, we don't, I wish we had a, a cloning factory. We don't. What we do believe in is in coming in and sharing a culture, and our culture is very specific, as we like to have 
fun. We like to develop people. We like to give you an opportunity. So everybody starts with a clean slate. Uh, but also we drive accountability. So uh, that means that, you know, like it or not, you all look like lovely people. You hire a company like ours to come in <laughs> and manage this, this operation. But there's expectations on the financial side and the service side. Yeah, but, I understand that. But I, I, by and large, I mean, even from a management standpoint, uh, Mike, we don't, if there's good, solid, competent people, our job is to help them and support them, okay. and not just switch them out for the sake of switching them out. Okay, and, and uh, when, if and when they do leave, mm -hmm. uh, I, I certainly think you guys are about the biggest company in the United States. I'm not sure if that's correct, but you're, you're up there. I, I, I just want to have an assurance that we're going to get some quality people yeah. here, because sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, here, because they can't find people who want to raise their family here. They can't, you know, for a number of reasons. Yeah. But I don't want to feel like we're, we're we get the short end of the stick. No. If we have to replace anybody. So. Yeah, I, I think you're. If I read you correctly, uh, Mike, the question is: Okay, so you're a big company, and we are, in fact, the largest third-party management company in the United States. Uh, but we're sensitive to that, and, and I'll go back to Colonial from a standpoint of we had a, a controller at Colonial in Fort Myers that was the Associate of the Year for Hola Troon in 2011. Trisha Ferguson, she had been there for 10 years. I had the pleasure of walking in to meet the treasurer and the president. And the president at the time has been used to be the former treasurer, and said, "Look, you know, we got this position down the road, and you know, Trisha has applied. It's a better position, it's better pay, and she really wants to get this job." So not only did I watch one of my favorite presidents start crying and shedding, I swear to God, he's like, he's like, okay, you know, I've worked so closely to this with this associate, we've fought so many battles, but if it's good for her, go on. So fast forward, Trish is there at West Bay, she's doing great, and we hired a gentleman by the name of Mario, and uh, last week, you know, the president that used to be the treasurer says, hey, I really didn't think we... We're going to be able to replace her, but I hate to say it. I mean, we kind of are forgetting her name because Mario is better. Uh, but all that is a conversation as well. We won't be poaching people because the reality is we won't have 94% or 93% of retention of our contracts if all we do is poach people. Um, the other comment that uh, Terry made to me was that, look, what I think is impressive about you guys, we've been here for 18, 20 years, is we've had three superintendents. The first one was Jeff, which is now at Tiburon, now in our office. Second one was Derek, which was we thought better than Jeff, and now Patrick, which is better than both of them. So we're always fortunate we have this this group of people that want to grow and, and, and develop. So and in critical positions, Mike, we would talk to you about you know to you as a group, and probably through the president, uh, and say we have this opportunity uh, because otherwise it just generates a bad relationship, and you know it's not a conversation we want to have. We'd rather make you happy. Yeah, like you said, we're the, you're the client. Yeah. Well, good. And, and I like to hear that because sometimes we we, we want to go a certain direction and and it, it doesn't happen. So it's nice to have somebody that might want to do right or wrong what the five of us have decided to do. And and but again, but if we disagree with you, we got to tell you yeah. we disagree with you in Hawaii. And you said okay, but you still feel you want to go that direction. Okay, but you know where the pitfalls are. Okay, so that's good. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. On your performa. It shows where you are going to be a hundred thousand dollars less a year on golf maintenance, mm -hmm. golf course maintenance. Mm -hmm. Where did you see the opportunities to reduce it by that much money? Buying power. What was that? Yeah, generally through our buying power, but buying uh, power, and also to have the the opportunity to to leverage our uh, our local resources in state if we thought we could do it. But again, uh, you know, that's that's what we felt we could do and maintain a level of quality that would be um, adequate, you know, to your expectation. Because the last thing I want to see is this course going down, and because right now. We're, we've been making improvements every year. Correct. And I don't want that to stop. 
And that's your product, right? That's the product that's out there. Your golfers come for that. I mean, it's impressive as you walk through your clubhouse and you see the amount of times the golf courses have won, uh, you know, best in, in uh, you know, uh, best golf course in the area. Uh, you know, it tells that there's a commitment there to do that. So absolutely. But our, our agronomic team felt, you know, pretty comfortable with, with those numbers from a standpoint of the analysis they did. Uh, so they felt that through our purchasing and, and you know moving some things around, they, they could get there. And, and at this point, it's a number, right? You know, we were we were given financials, but you know we'll take a look at at detailed historicals if we were awarded the contract to say, okay, this is where our spend was at. You know, and then and then take a look at expectations moving forward. Do we need to reallocate resources throughout the F and B or golf ops or agronomy? Yeah. What can we do differently to help? And and like I said, at, at a one hour tour and 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 financials, we we would we would love to see more detailed financials to be able to say, yep, this number is is exactly what it needs to be, or does it need to be? hundred thousand dollars more doesn't need to be a hundred thousand dollars less it's it's numbers on a piece of paper at this point in time until we can truly say this is what we feel comfortable with moving forward it's also and it's, work with you on that and but it's based on our benchmarking as well so he, here's the thing is look we're, we're not selling you a car okay let's get straight right we're trying to develop a, a value proposition so the idea is that as you create that strategic plan going forward to make sure that you know if you say look we can't afford to spend you know 20 percent of our loss a year being in food and beverage I think it was 50 something odd this year but or projected obviously with COVID uh, but the idea is that your overall Overall value and satisfaction levels, uh, you know, and, and additional and the additional financial levels are at a point that the members and residents say, "Hey, this is a really, really great value." Is there a percentage you can use to the total revenues or something? I, I, I don't know either. I mean, you say a hundred thousand dollars is a lot, but is there a rule of thumb you can say, "Well, this is what it should be as a percentage to something"? A rule of thumb of percentage of revenue to to uh, cost of maintenance is that we're looking at? Yeah. The maintenance on the golf course, you think you can bring it down by a hundred thousand? Are you? So are you using any kind of like? Well, you that's been a it's been a benchmark within our our company to say when we go into operations, can we produce the same product, and what's that dollar amount? What's that percentage that we can save via early order program through? Different vendors or on equipment, um, you know that's that's where we we. So this is just historically the number you save everybody when you. If you no, uh, it, it's typically really benchmarked against like properties. So we have, let's say, for lack of a better analogy, there's three buckets. There's a top tier, let's say, uh, uh, property type. There's a, uh, a four star, a three star. We kind of look at the property, say, okay, here's where we look. And then the other part of it is there's a synergy between 18 and 36 holes, and can we leverage that versus the buying power? We look at our benchmarks and look at the course when Jeff Caffey was here, and say we feel this is an adequate number to maintain this golf course. Uh, and, and but again. We're not known. If anything, our company was founded on the uh, agronomics. You know, True North is not known for having you know the lowest maintenance budget in the area, but by having some of the best uh, agronomic levels uh, in the area. So we, that's how we usually will do it on a on a uh, from a pro forma standpoint. Okay. I guess I got a couple more. <coughs> Good. The uh, yeah. The incentive management fee. Mm-hmm. The incentive management number that you came up with is who? In other words, it says here twenty thousand or whatever, twenty five thousand. It's twenty, typically twenty percent. It's there's an incentive program. It's a twenty percent. Uh, okay, make it simple. Let's say it's usually twenty percent. What we propose, twenty percent of the base fee. So let's say if the base fee is a thousand dollars, twenty percent will be, you know, uh, if it's ten thousand dollars, will be two thousand dollars per year. But you get to determine what the factors are, and you can say it's a hundred percent financial, uh, Zach. I want you to make sure that you meet or exceed. 
exceed the financial bottom line. And you know what? I'll give you one more. If this bottom line does not fund the incentive fee, there's no incentive fee. Okay. You know what? We still feel incentivized. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. I didn't even mention the termination fee. Termination fee? Yeah, I shouldn't bring that up there because we'll discuss that later. Well, you see, the thing is, I, it's almost irrelevant because you'll never terminate us, but okay, we can talk about it later. Now, so the termination clause, I think, is what you're referring to, is if we, this is, this is how we feel. We feel we deliver on our promises, and that's how we are. If we miss the bottom line, you know, uh, and you're not happy with us, you have a clause that says you can fire these guys, and, and they'll be in the contract. It's typically you miss the bottom line two years in a row, two full fiscal years in a row, because we need some, you know, some runway. And if you're not happy, hey, if you don't want us here, we don't, you know what I mean? Not only you, but in general. If you don't want you here, we don't have to pay a termination fee. No, I don't. I, no, we have to pay. If we have an agreement for two years, and you say, you know, let's say we're, let's say there's a notification clause, for instance, of 90 days. You say, hey, look, we've decided we, you know, it's been great, but you guys need to go away. Then our job becomes, unfortunately which, as I just told you, is probably 7 to 6% of the time in the last five years, uh, is to say to you, okay, how do we transition out the same way we transitioned in? Because the reality is, uh, in, our, in our industry, we want you to say, hey, it didn't work out at Sun Lake. Should that be the case? But these guys were pros on the way in and on the way out. We don't have any poison pills. We don't, that's not how we operate. And then on your pro forma, on your revenues, you stated here that you base this on a 5% growth of green fees and driving range fees, merchandise sales, and, mer and membership dues in true year one, and then 2% annually afterwards. So you think we should take a 5% increase? That's what we use for the pro forma. Again, in a raise, you're asking us, you know, limited financial information and everything. We find that... This is a relationship, it's just a three-way relationship. It's a relationship with us and you, and you and your constituency, right? So if there's enough value and say, hey, we're going to increase the dues, that's we thought that there is enough there based on the market uh, comps and the quality and value we want to deliver, that you can justify a 5% increase in year one. You'd have to present that to them like him. <laughs> <laughs> I have one like this, but he's Kevlar. <laughs> Should I bring that one? I got one more, and then I'll leave you. No, it's okay. Well, I bring this up to everybody. So you, according to your, your breakdown, we're going, to, we're going to food and beverage. Yeah. According to what you propose, and I guess you're being consistent with where we are now, you're saying that the food and beverage cost of goods sold should be 35%. Labor would be around 54%, and then operating and total revenue is around 26%. That's obviously not acceptable, but I mean, if that's where we got to start, we got that's where we got to start. My question really is, where do we end up, and how long would it take to get there? We're only talking percentages. Yeah. I'm I'm smiling, chuckling. No, like I mean, I'll, I'll look. We right. talked about this a, a little bit. You know, getting into Getting into the weeds is what I would like to call yeah, it. Yeah, but I, I think that, down right, the candidly, it's, it's like this. If, you, if you're asking us, can you get that operation to break even, all things being normal, sure. The question is going to be also, we're now, we're now focusing on the, that number, right? And it goes to the question that Zach put up there. Is it amenity? Is it a profit center? Or is it something in between? And he goes back to your point of, you know, what kind of... I know it's not what you want to hear. No. If you want to say, can I go ahead and make that break even, cut the costs and make this... You can. I, are, are they going to be happy? That's also the question you want to ask. Make them happy. So what if, you you tell me, if you tell me the best it can be, if you tell me the best it can be, we have to lose 5%, that's what we'll consider. I think we can, yeah, I think we can definitely make strides between the 20% number and the break-even number. If you tell us that the goal is to break even, we'll have to bring then uh, develop a model that gets us to break even. I want you to tell me what you can do. I can, uh, like I said, we have operations that make 20%, 30% profit. We have operations that, you know, we have operations that lose 50% on the dollar because the, that particular board has decided that, you know, see, there's a misnomer that a lot of folks think in private clubs that the, private, the, the food and beverage is the profit center. Here's semi-private, so you have the opportunity to decide what you want to do. Uh, most private clubs, they say, hey, we got to subsidize that because our members believe they're paying dues towards having that as an amenity for them. What we would have to do is, is Again, 
once the, the business of banquets and events come back, I think we can leverage that. Uh, once we, just from what I saw, leveraging the local community, I think we can leverage that as an opportunity because it's not only about servicing the golfers, is can we get the, the local residents to really support that place and get them to go there and increase volume and what else can we do with, with, with programming for them and increase the covers, then your efficiency gets better. If you ask me, can we make that break even? Yes, we can make that break break even. Right, but I'll, I'm telling you. Could have said we could lose a five percent. I don't care. It'll take you uh, three years to get there. That's all I'm asking. I understand, Ray. I, I and I would if I believe that that's an answer that makes sense and it's a transparent answer. I would give it to you. I I just believe at this point we based on what we saw. Go ahead, uh, I'll, I'll take some heat there. So, so Ray, I'll step outside the box and say, yeah, I can, I can make it run at zero. I can make it run at at five percent, right? Remove some of the G&A labor that you throw back in on top of that, which is not an industry benchmark that's normal. You don't see a a portion of the GM salary, a portion of I can't remember who, what other salary was thrown. Forty percent of G&A labor was thrown in on top of F and B. So it's not a true benchmark of this is the total amount of labor that we're utilizing for this operation. If you take forty percent of that G&A labor out, what is that? Where does that get you? Does anybody know? What's that? Yeah. I think well, I'm just saying from a fine, you know, when you're, you're talking about on, on paper, right, you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Don't you have that? I guess using Sun and Lake and your true properties mm -hmm. on similar type properties, what type of percentages do you expect for the cost of goods, sales, labor, et cetera? Yeah, we, you, you typically would have your, your cost of sales at 35% is, is not a bad number. That's a pretty good number there uh, because it's, it's you know, midway. I mean, if you go for profit, your cost of sales will be under 30. Your blended cost of sales will be under 30. Uh, your, your, um, you typically would have your labor is going to probably be um, right around the 40 to 45%, depending on how much service you want to have out there and what kind of level, and also how many banquets you do, because your mix is going to be important. If you do a lot of banquets, you have a lot more hourly staff, and then your operating expenses are generally between 10 and 15%. So you net between 10 and 20% if it's a for profit operation. Uh, most clubs in general are right around, you know, like this, are right around the break even to lose 10%, 20%. So. But I like it better when he asks. No, I'm only kidding. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to be difficult, right? But I do like your questions. So, right. What are you? I'm going to have to rehearse with him. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, look. I, I again is. Uh, um, we we ask we get asked these questions where people want to know. Give me this number, like you know, specifically. And then the challenge we have is that we come back later and says, "Well, you know, I got every time I go out, my neighbors are like lynching me on the street because, you know, the hamburger went this or that." And that's not really. We, we're very mindful. We couldn't get to where we are without financial uh, accountability and performance, right? Uh, but at the same token, you, you, that's where I go back to that strategy and that vision. It's like, look, guys, here's what we're trying to get. Here's what we like to have. And then it's our job to come back and educate you with a plan that's not just done solely on an hour tour. We need to understand this a little bit more in detail. But again, you know, we have 500 of these things, and, and we make them work to whatever degree of financial delivery that, you know, that is is being asked, and if you say, "Look, we want to leverage this to the hilt," and yeah, I don't want to have another member function in there and get all the banquets in the world, which I'm not saying that it's what you're saying, then we can leverage to that. Uh, but we we got to really understand that uh, and the levels of service. And we can help you walk you through that process if you're like, "We don't know what we want it to be." That's where some of these surveys come in. What does the membership base? What does the board want to see? What what type of experience do they want to have? Okay, this is the type of experience. This is what we need to be able to offer. This is what we need to be able to do from a service level to get it to X at 5% loss, 10% loss, 10% gain. I mean, we've, like I said, we've got a wide range of, of operations. 
but they are specific to each property. It's not homogenized, right? It's not cookie cutter. I come in and I put X, X, X in place and all of a sudden you're profitable. Yeah. Every place is different. And, and, and that's why it's, thanks, it's so imperative to understand what the board wants, understand what the membership base wants. You know, I want somebody to fix the problem. Right, and then I also the, the question is, again, going back to what is the flow through, like uh, as you just asked, as far as the flow through on the food and beverage revenue. So you got your food and beverage dollar, and you got to take a percentage for COGS, and you take a percentage for this. How much of that comes off of your dues, and do your do your members feel like they want to, hey, I'd rather go there and have a good meal at a good value, and I'm willing to participate that on the dues front rather than on the F&B front. Uh, so that, those are all considerations as well. Do you have an idea on how we need to increase the traffic through our restaurant? Mm -hmm. Because we've got a multi-million dollar asset that is not being utilized at all. And you know, we, we talk about it and we keep trying different things. Uh, something's got to give. <laughs> Well, well, let me ask you a question. Why do you think that is in general? Like, what, what is the, from your perspective, it goes back to, goes back to that question is, why do you think that people are not patronizing? I mean, you made a large investment in that building, right? And you made a commitment. So why do you think it's not sticking? Uh, what is, what do you hear? A lot of it's pricing. Pricing is too high, too low? Yep. Okay. So people are not patronizing because they feel the pricing is out of whack, and, and so you don't get the number of covers that support the volume? And I, th well, I think my personal opinion is that I think we have a bad reputation for service, for the quality, and for price. Okay. Yeah. And besides that, it's good? Yeah, besides that, <laughs> okay. it's just everything is yeah. lovely. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> and I, it's... It, What's the problem is, is that we can't, or so far anyway, we have not yet to, to get the people back in. Now, I've got some, I, my thought is that one of the best ways is to say you're under new management because everybody gives it another try, which could be bad or good or could be bad. So they'll try it once. <laughs> and if it's not spot on, they'll never come back well, again. Exactly. And that's where we're at right now. I, uh, we had a lady in there that's been here for a couple of years and didn't know that the restaurant was named Island View. So I, 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 there's just something that's got to change. Absolutely. And, and, and so um, it kind of uh, take me back to, to Zach just made the comment, they'll try you once and they'll come back again. So you got to you kind of make a promise to to the community. Uh, you got to provide them with the opportunities that are somewhat risk-free, right? They, it's their dollars, and just like you and I are going to say, hey, I'm going to go outside the gates or outside the area to go eat somewhere, why would I think of that of that, uh, of that outlet? So they got to feel, okay, come out and, and, and see it. And it doesn't mean you got to give everything away. you got to create opportunities for them to try the food, try the fair, meet the people. And if they won't come to you, how are we communicating with them? Do we have a campaign? Are we putting out videos? Are, like one of the things we had to do through COVID is take the restaurants to, you know, the houses of, of folks. We had to-go meals. We had pre-prepared meals. We had meal kits. We had, you know, all in you know, our chefs doing video classes. Uh, Drinks to go. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we have to engage them, and it's got to it's gotta take some time to do that. But then more importantly, when they come in, I know you said somebody said price. I, I, I yeah. always like to think. That's me. Right? I always like to think in terms of value because I think everybody around here could pay $30 for a meal and say, I'll never do that again. And pay $30 for a meal is like, man, I should have really paid 40 for that meal because it was that good. And it's finding out how do you maximize the value uh, of that. Doesn't mean you got to charge more, but when people see value on, on something, but it's to your point, how long have you been trying to do this now? A couple of years to get people engaged? 
Yeah, I think so. Uh, one, one of one of the literally, people, I mean, we we reopened after the remodel in yeah. October and had COVID in March. So, so yeah, so maybe uh, not necessarily the easiest period to yeah. to leverage that. Also, I mean, I know that you were the greatest course in town. Is there an opportunity to be the greatest restaurant in town or the be- greatest golf course restaurant in town? The best hamburger in town. There's got to be a strategy to change the winds of of reputation. Don't get what, what the, people here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> meeting here are residents for the most part. Right. And most of the probably golf members. That's what my one of my questions dissecting that group of knowing how many of your your golfing members support the restaurant, what that percentage represents, what percentage of the community, you know, supports the restaurant, and then how many people outside of the community support the restaurant? And I'm talking a la carte. I'm not talking <coughs> banquet business, yeah, right? But you start dissecting that, and then, okay, why aren't more people coming in? And you, you truly find that answer. This is, it is, the a, blue is it the service? It's a blue-collar community. Right, sure. And one of the people bidding on with you stopped and had lunch two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And there was two of them. They played golf, just wanted to see the course. They had two two sandwiches, two sides of salad, and two things of French fries, two non-alcoholic drinks. It was forty-seven bucks. Now, that is not going to make it in Sutton Lake. Okay, it's yeah. not going to do it. And I, I took my wife there a month ago. I didn't really want to go, but she wanted to go with this couple there. We had a hamburger and French fries and non-alcoholic drinks and mine with my 10% discount was 36 bucks. I mean, yeah. I do not want to go pay 36 bucks for lunch. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. So I'm not going to do it. <laughs> even if it's a really really good lunch. Even that, that's what I said when you said it's uh, how good could a hamburger be for well, again, but you said hamburger, I see, and then good lunch. But I get your point. So what we have to do is come in. It goes back to, I mean, you, I appreciate it because you've made a couple of really important points that hopefully came through in the presentation. You, this feedback is one, but I hate to tell you is, I know it's a surprise, not everybody might agree with you out there. So when we go and survey the, the, the community, they've got to give us their thoughts. And, 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 and again, the proof is in the pudding, right, Mike? You might not go, but if the five of you all of a sudden see a 20% increase in revenue because people are happy with the thing. Says, oh, I'm still won't going, but at least I don't have to deal with the with the losses in the restaurant. But then the other part of it is as as relaunching this this uh, this outlet. Um, is finding ways to engage engage them, and then our our corporate team would come come uh, come down and and help support those events, whatever those events are, to showcase this this uh, the relaunch of this of this uh, of this space. And the relaunch could just merely be it's not changing the name necessarily. It could just be you have a particular concept or series of concepts to get people either from outside in or from the inside out to to the, the restaurant, but also to make sure it's executed properly. Number number two. And that people start saying, okay, maybe it is worthwhile. I mean, Zach just did a, an event at one of our courses. Uh, it's a bit out of the ordinary, and all this would be, again, vetted through you, uh, which is co- it's a company called, or an event called Seltzerland. To your point of people don't know about the place. And so why don't you tell them a little bit about where it was and what happened? If you can. Yeah, they, they had contacted us about six, seven months ago. They've run, like, beer and bourbon fests at stadiums previously of, of 6,000 people, and obviously with COVID, that completely got wiped out. So um, they, they came to us and said, hey, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars to shut down your golf course for the day. And you're like, whoo. So we went back historically and said, how much money do we make on the golf course that day? What do we make on food and beverage? We went back to them and said, here's that dollar amount. They said, okay. And um, they literally only shut down four holes. Uh, It was uh, 650 people that came in. Of those 650, 50 of them had probably been to the golf course at that point in time. So 80% were, were female and or brought their husband, boyfriend out, and they essentially paid X amount of dollars, walked around the golf course to different 20 different stations and tried different seltzers. And they had, Hormel was a sponsor, 
Um, but the, the overarching comment that we received was, I didn't realize how nice the golf course was. I loved being able to be out here and, and walk around the golf course. I just had no idea it was so pretty. And, and I think what Ricardo's trying to get, it, get across the table here is the fact that you need to think outside the box in bringing people outside of Sun and Lake community onto your, your golf course. And that, that was one way for us to do it, and we didn't lose money, right? We made the same amount of money, and we got more exposure. Well, you so probably made more money. You got six hundred eyeballs that you know that you didn't see, and you know we could every one of those could be a bounce back opportunity to come back to the restaurant. Uh, and um, in the other parties, the word is out there that hey, not only these guys are good, but again, we also want to do it in an environment that you feel comfortable. That it's not going to jeopardize who you are, or what your image is. But it's a if you got to reach out, you got to reach out. It's like people tell me, who is the best kept secret in whatever town X? I mean. I've been hearing for 20 years. Says that's great. So when you go out, you go out with a whimper because nobody will notice, right? Uh, you don't want that. You want people to say, you know what? I never realized there was an option. I mean, when I, and I'm trying to remember the name of the restaurant. There's one in Arizona that uh, is actually a former golf course restaurant, and I'm trying to remember the name of the golf course. And the new owner actually came in. It's overlooking the golf course, but it's been segregated now. You just have a view of the golf course, and they just created a concept that was standalone, really good food. Good pricing, and it's a it's a local eatery. Yeah, it serves the golf community, but it's not just that. And it's cool, and you got you know you got bean bags, and you got you know cornhole going, and you got activities, and you have fire pits in the winter, and people are you know you have might have a mariachi band one day, you might have whatever it is. But they create this whole programming that people go, we're gonna go there, just above and beyond for the food. The fact that it's located within or adjacent to a golf course, that's you know, it looks nice, right? And it's not just to that. The one thing you gotta keep in mind though is you gotta always have a space because your golfers, like the the, the co mingling of those crowds sometimes could be an issue. Mike? That's a, that's a, uh, no, I, I just think it's get, trying to get people in and give us a second chance. And we can't have lunches. This community cannot have a Thirty-six or a forty-seven dollar lunch. I mean, it's it's not going to work. Yeah. Then I mean, is there a rewards program? Is there an opportunity to get somebody for you know promote frequency? Uh, is there you know we we've had clubs that have looked at that and and generated some kind of uh, added you know added repeat business, uh, but it all starts with the quality. Yeah, and Having we don't have truck. that expertise. You guys are supposed yeah. to. That's you've seen a lot of success with food trucks, depending upon your food license. It's, a, it's an easy way for you to get out into the community and sell what you have to offer on your menu, even though people aren't coming in. And, and as that grows in popularity, they're like, oh, yeah, I forget that's at the golf course. I just know the food truck. But you can still get the same product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you got course. tennis, you got uh, your shuffleboard, it's a great facility you guys just built. Uh, I mean, are we doing anything to cater to that facility to try and bring in revenue? I mean, these are all different kinds of eyeballs. Look, I mean, I come from a golf background, and it's kind of interesting for me now being in this business that, I, you know, for the last five, ten years, as we look at, you know, used to be in a club was 70% was about the golf, right? Those, the golf was 70% of the reason why people joined. Now it's one of the 20%. So it's changed. So even the way golfers consume the, the, the place is, is a lot different. Any questions, Joseph or, or Neil? I think or, we, we or were... Or the public. Any questions from right. the public? We wore him down, but this yeah, gentleman's a question. I get it. <laughs> yes, sir. The reason why you don't look at him is because we have a white elephant here. We have a beautiful restaurant, we have a beautiful kitchen, we have wonderful parking, we have good surroundings and all work, but we don't have any people. I can understand the 7,000 odd people here. And nobody comes into the restaurant. I, had, I talked to one woman, one guy in front, and she said, What's that? I said, That's a golf course, a clubhouse. Well, I thought it was a nursing home. <laughs> well, and sometimes, you know, there's, you, know, you never know. Yeah. I made a mistake one time going down the old back and waited an hour and 20 minutes, yeah. which I'll never do again. And I cannot understand why that restaurant isn't packed up here. <laughs> so, it's the advertising or whatever it is. and that's the basic problem we have here is that white elephant is killing us 
It's draining the money, it's draining resources and everything else. And people are unhappy because of the, they, they say, well, change the menu. Well, they change the menu. Well, short the menu. Well, they chop the menu. And you know, it just doesn't appeal to the people. It doesn't seem to be a friendly 19th hole for the guys or a restaurant for the women, a little little flowery and that sort of thing like that. If people understood that, maybe they could fix it. You're yeah. talking about intimacy. Exactly. You know, when you when you walk into a restaurant, you walk into a sports bar. Thank you, by the way. It's thank you for your feedback there. Right. It's it's this big. I will say the restaurant size, you know, you've you've finished the outside, it's a great space. But unless you have a hundred people in there, it looks kinda empty, right? And when you walk in to a restaurant and you don't see a bunch of people there, do you get that warm, fuzzy feeling like, all right, this place is happening. We're going to have a few cocktails. We're going to have some fun. You go, whoa, where's, uh, what's, what's the problem here? Right? That's what I think when I walk into. So maybe it's an option to shrink the space. right? Do you utilize all of that area all day, every day? And I think that's what you're well, trying to elaborate how do you- on. How do you create? How do you create certain areas within spaces within spaces? You don't have to go crazy. You just spend money, so you're not. It's going to be right. you got to be creative, because to my previous point, and I think that's what this gentleman was getting at is, if I have a ladies' day or you know, if I have a ladies' golf day, but then I have a ladies' card day, those two needs are different. Even though they're both ladies' groups, they're looking for different things. I'll just say one thing, and then I'm done with this. Half the members don't come into the clubhouse anymore. Because it's just not... No, because there's an epidemic going. Yeah. I mean, it's a pa- oh, epidemic. that's fair enough. Yeah. So if half the members don't come in because they're scared to death about the pandemic, why do you expect everybody else to be coming in? You watch the TV, all they tell you is we're closing bars, we're closing this, yeah. we're closing that, wear your mask, don't go out, don't do anything, you know. Anybody? I don't know what everybody expects. If you think we're going to turn traffic around... Until this thing is, situ- is, is settled yeah. with the vaccine and everything, guys are living in a make-believe world. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, again, I mean, I, I really, you know, you're, you're, I like it. Uh, you got a good point there. I mean, it's kind of, it's not going to be a flip of a switch, but I do believe that there's, there's other ways. Like, you know, we have a lot of clubs that we have members said, "Hey, would you come back in the clubhouse?" Uh, I'm thinking of one of my clubs in in Miami, about half and half, and half of the members said we were just not interested you know we don't want to deal with this we're too afraid now the other half says yeah I mean I've been waiting for you guys to open up it's been forever so what we've done is we actually found out that the the revenue from to go orders and providing them with good quality people are like hey it's good because even though I want to go food I don't necessarily want to go outside into the big big world particularly if I'm reassured that my protocols I know that it's Mary back in the kitchen that prepares my, my food I haven't seen in three months, but I know that's the individual. I know it's Ron delivering my kitchen. I know if somebody's sick, you know they're gonna send them home. And the whole, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole cycle of preparation is safe. And I think that's a really we've seen that as a really, really critical piece. I think we can do better even now. Yeah. But I think if everybody thinks it's going to turn around, it's going to happen. No, I don't, I don't think anybody thinks. But this has been going on way before COVID. Yeah. I mean, so it's when we're talking, we're not talking about what COVID did to us. That's, they've hurt everybody. Yeah, but yeah. we've had a cycle for the last three, four years. You're um, basically saying, down. hey, we, we, what we need to do, and I think you set really good precedent, is like, what is the role, uh, what, what is the road to break even, right, as a starting point? What is the road, what is the plan to break even? How are we going to get there? And incrementally, as we get through the pandemic, you know, there's a vaccine, but, you know, even, even with that, it's going to take some ramp up time. Not say that anybody's right or wrong. I think everybody's right in this scenario is just the timeline and setting realistic expectations, but good points. Yeah, I think there's a number of things we can probably do with the restaurant. And, you know, one of the uh, things with what we're looking at doing here now is the timing is good because by the time we make any change, assuming we make a change, um, it'll be hopefully the pandemic will be over and we can relaunch. Um, I think we've made some improvements. I can tell you that 
you know, from my perspective, my first several experiences at the restaurant haven't been that positive. Uh, my last one was actually a positive experience, so I think we're making some improvement. But, you know, to put a big investment in right now to build up the clientele is not the time to do it. But continue to make those improvements so when people come, they want to come back. I, You know, I've been... I've not been a major uh, participant in the restaurant because it is ex relatively expensive and the experience is less than I get other places. So, What would you say, uh, I think also leveraging your outside spaces, uh, gentlemen, is key. You have that whole space behind it and creating these bubbles. We're seeing more and more taking the, the restaurant out into the open uh, when needed because some people just don't want to be inside. Actually, a lot of folks, uh, what's being shared is that the transmission rate is very high inside, but outside is actually very low. So, I mean, figuring out ways outside, you know, just not the physical plan because at the end of the day, if the loss goes down, you don't care if they're served in the parking lot, right, at the end of the day. If, if, if people are happy and the bottom line is good, once we can serve them legally, right, anywhere on property and it's coming out of that kitchen, it's added revenue, right? So we just got to think a little bit more creatively there. Um, good. But, but I think it's a, the overall experience is what people are looking for. And then if the experience is good, then the price is secondary. So what would you say is the most popular restaurant for for? for residents here in Sun Lake, anywhere, inside or outside, where the people tend to gravitate, besides the outback. Watering holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for steak, the watering holes about as good as it gets, but um, there's... there's <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do, but that's okay. <laughs> hmm? It is. The watering hole is higher. Um, Chicane's is another popular place with higher prices. They shut it down at 8 o'clock. Yeah. Because if you drive down through town, Blue Lagoon, Chili's, Outback, Dimitri's, all those places are serving dinner until 9 or 10 o'clock. Yeah. They all got people in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here, you don't get in the door and get your dinner ordered by 5 minutes to 8. You are an SOL. Yeah, good, good feedback. What, what about from a standpoint of casual, like a casual bite? Where would you go? Like if Mike, I want to take Mike for a good burger that's a good value that doesn't cost me thirty-six dollars. Where would I go? <laughs> Caddy Shack, broken, oh, broken egg, yeah. Caddy Shack, Caddy Shack, Caddy Shack, Cody's, 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 okay. Good meal for. <laughs> So uh, I know it's late. You guys have had a really long day. Thank you for your time. Any questions that we have not answered, anything we have not addressed, and then the public, I don't know if any of you have any questions, and I thank you for your time because this feels more like punishment uh, <laughs> for you guys. I mean, I heard you had a board meeting and then, you know, another, uh, another uh, group. Are you guys and, uh, tired yet? <clears throat> no. Nah. But anything that you feel we didn't address or anything that left any doubt, uh, we'd, love, we'd love to partner with Southern Lake. We think we can help. Um, our approach is more we start with the end in mind because we just find out we just toss, toss stuff out there. You know, you kind of end up with, you kind of manage to where the number is at a lot of times, but we understand that there's a, a definite uh, mandate to fix the financial piece of this, uh, and it could either be top line driven or bottom line driven um, or expense line driven. So, but anything, Ray, in particular, that you feel we haven't addressed, or gentlemen, I'm just giving you a hard time because you gave me one and I enjoy that. Uh, I'll be in touch. <laughs> very good, sir. Uh, Craig or gentlemen, anybody? No, no I think it's been very good. helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We wore them down. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. having us. Appreciate you coming.